Dear participants, on behalf of myself and General Co-Chair Professor Liliana Gabrilovska, welcome to the 2020 edition of the Crown Con Conference. We would have loved to welcome you in person in the original location of the conference that was supposed to be held in Rome, Italy, but as we all know, the ongoing emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic made impossible for many of us to travel and meet in person. We decided thus to switch to the virtual format. Despite the change of plans, we are confident that this virtual edition of CAMCON 2020 will be both interesting and pleasant to attend, thanks to the editorial efforts by people at EAI that we thank for their support in the organization. The conference program is composed of 14 high quality papers that cover all major technical aspects related to the cognitive radio networks. We have in fact contributions that address physical layer issues focusing in particular on the collection of information towards efficient coexistence, works on resource sharing, network organization, and network optimization, papers on verticals enabled by cognitive radio, and finally, contributions that present and discuss spectrum management approaches and business opportunities made possible by cognitive radio in 5G. In addition to the technical papers, we are glad to introduce in the conference an interesting panel on the topic of cognitive networks in the context of software defined everything that will provide new perspectives on the role of cognitive radio and networking in the next generation of flexible networks and applications, highlighting their challenges and potential. We would like to thank Dr. Jorge Pereira, Principal Scientific Officer at the Future Connectivity Systems Unit of the Directorate General Communication Networks, Content and Technology of the European Commission for proposing, organizing, and coordinating this. Before leaving you to the fruition of the, our technical program, we would like to thank the colleagues that made this event possible. First, the authors that decided to submit their work at CrownCom 2020, allowing us to present you a high quality program. And of course, the members of the organizing committees, the chairs and members of the technical program committee and the reviewers fundamental for carefully selecting the best contributions. We would like to thank in particular, Dr. Adrian Clicks, general co-chair of last year's CrownCom edition, for his fundamental support in all phases of the conference organization, from the definition of its scope to the management of the reviewing process. We sincerely hope that you will enjoy the CrownCom 2020 conference. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the EAI CrownCom 2020, the 15th EAI International Conference on Cognitive Radio-Oriented Wireless Network. My name is Kristina Petrovicheva and I'm the Conference Manager of CrownCom 2020. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 emergency, I'm not able to meet you all in person. Therefore, I'm using this opportunity to address the organizing committee, the keynote speakers, the authors and the participants on behalf of the European Alliance for Innovation. Thank you for being a part of this conference. In particular, I would like to thank the General Chair, Professor Luca Denardis from the Sapiens University of Roma, the General Chair Liliana Gavrilovska and the Technical Program Committee Chair Adrian Klicks, together with the whole organizing committee for their hard and excellent work throughout the whole process of conference preparation. During today's event, there are truly many ways how you can actively participate and enjoy the online interaction. During the streaming, there is a Slack platform available for all the participants where you can discuss the presentations and participate in the Q&A sessions. Upon accessing the link below for CrownCom 2020 workspace, you can enter all channels. I would also like to use this opportunity to invite you to join us for the next edition of CrownCom in China in 2021. We will keep you updated and the news about this event will be available on the conference website. Should you be interested in becoming a part of the next year edition organizing committee or the technical program committee, please do not hesitate to contact us at the email address below. In addition, if you are interested in organizing an event with EAI, such as a conference, a workshop or a seminar, please do not hesitate to contact us at the email address as well. We will be happy to provide you with more information. Now, our community manager Michal will talk more about what EAI does, who we are and how you can get involved in our various activities. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy this conference.
Hi everyone, my name is Michal Dudic. I'm the Community Manager at EEI, European Alliance for Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference uh, and say a few words about who we are and what we can do for you and your research career. In short, EEI is a global community for a greener, healthier and smarter world. As of today, we are home to more than 60,000 members from 167 countries and we reach out to tens of thousands of subscribers. As an organization, we are nonprofit from day one, and what is most important to us is that we remain open to all researchers from all around the world thanks to membership that is completely free. We organize more than 100 events annually, such as this conference, and we do so in publishing partnership with Springer. I said in the beginning that EAI is a community, so let's talk about what that means and what it means for you. To put it briefly, we give our members a platform that builds their research. We do it with three main online community services where members come together to help each other write a better paper, get an objective review, and get recognized fairly. The three services in question are EAI Compass, Community Review, and EAI Index. Firstly, EAI Compass is an online app where you can meet and connect with new colleagues and get feedback on your paper as well as your presentation. In addition to that, it lets you download all full papers that will be presented at this conference and you can vote on your favorite presentations as well as see everyone who is here and connect with them. You can do this right now if you go to EAI Compass website, compass.eai.eu. Next, we are improving the classic conference review process with community review. It has already been in use at all our events since 2019 and we were very excited to hear a lot of positive feedback from program committee members regarding the reliability and the speed of the community review. Let's talk briefly about what community review does. Essentially, it is a website that shows abstracts of papers that are right in the middle of the review process, as long as the authors allow it, of course and all EAI members may then bid to review specific papers. When they submit their bid, they put in their bio and their qualifications, which are sent to the program committee, who can then decide whether or not this bidder is qualified to review the paper they bid on. This relatively easy access to review opportunities means that bidders really need to put their best foot forward if they wish to be selected, which improves the quality of the entire review process. At the end of the day, this benefits you, the author. And last but not least, let me tell you a thing or two about EAI Index. EAI Index is our credit-based evaluation system that we rolled out this year to all of our conferences and journals that allow you to climb the global ranks of EAI community and get recognized for your work. It calculates a number value for most actions you make, such as getting your paper accepted or submitting a review, and these numbers accumulate for 12 months. At the end of this 12-month period, we put together a ladder of all EEI members, and the ones at the top receive a nomination to one of the membership ranks – senior member, distinguished member, or fellow. For each action that is eligible for EEI index credits, we'll look at the quality of your action as it was evaluated by another member of the community, such as, for example, the review score of your submission. To make sure that the system is fair to newcomers, every 12 months the credit count gets erased, the ones at the top receive their nominations, and every member starts at zero for the following 12 months. And finally, Smart Submit is a collaboration feature that is coming later this year. It will allow you to submit your research ideas and your work in progress abstracts to get the kind of help and feedback you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for co-authors, maybe you would like to find a mentor or a mentee, or maybe you want to find out how the community feels about your idea. This is what Smart Submit is designed for. Ultimately, it's about helping you write a better paper and increasing your chances of getting accepted. Again, we will be launching this feature later this year, so stay tuned. And so I'm going to leave you with many different ways to get engaged at different levels. There are lots of opportunities in many of our events and publications, which means many ways to connect with people and collaborate. You may learn more about everything I just talked about at our website, eai.eu. 
These services exist to help you and to make your lives easier, so we encourage you to send us your comments, ideas, and feedback to community at eai.eu. And if you are interested in volunteering and contributing, you can let us know at the same email address. Don't forget that you can use EAI Compass to vote on presentations in real time to determine which ones are the best, as well as to download all full papers that will be presented today. Just make sure that you log in using the same email address as the one you used to register to this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please enjoy the conference and I hope we will see everyone online soon. Hello everyone, I'm now going to present to you this work called Active User Blind Detection Through Deep Learning. This work has been done in collaboration with Diane Duchemin in the framework on my and her PhD in the Marocas Inria team and under the supervision of Professor Jean-Marie Gors, Claire Gourceau and Leonardo Cardozo. It has been partly funded by the INR project EFIL and by the common lab Inria Nokia Bell Labs. So, our work takes place in the context of machine type communications with a special focus on dense sensor networks and with sporadic uplink traffic due to small data bursts. These networks are populated with low cost devices with restricted radio functionalities as well as scarce power and computational resources. But they have the same efficiency demands as the current communication standards or even higher like for 5G and beyond or tactile internet. This induces important constraints regarding the limited power and the radio resources, but also with regards to the small amount of data to be transmitted by the sensors, meaning that the amount and duration of transmission must be minimized. So we must avoid high signaling overhead, which would drastically reduce the operational lifetime of such devices, as they would spend more time and energy to transmit protocol-related messages than actually useful payload data. Hence, it would be ideal to have an all-in-one grand fee uplink message, encapsulating the access request, the device and the identifier, and the data. In this challenging objective of grand free access, one of the main issues is the active user detection, that is, the detection of the active subset of sensor nodes by the base station. A dedicated spectrum sharing technique is required to enable the transmission of the user identities while having a large number of potential active users and fluctuating traffic. And code domain NOMA seems to be a good candidate for that. With this access technique, the base station takes charge of all the complexity of the active user detection. And it's a challenging task when we take into account that avoiding an unchecked procedure with a short all-in-one access request also limit the channel state information available at the receiver. And that the optimal active user detector is known to have a high complexity that's not really compatible with real-time implementation. Iterative version of the optimal active user detector may drastically lower the complexity, but they also lower the performance. And other propositions using a compressive sensing formulation also trade the accuracy with complexity, so they do not guarantee to achieve the optimal solution. So we can state the objective of this presentation. Design a detection algorithm for massive NOMA, which meets both goals of low complexity and getting closer to the performance of the optimal solution. The communication community has shown a special interest for deep learning in this kind of scenario, with previous work that used deep learning for NOMA regarding the resource allocation and another one focused on active user detection but in an LTE context. Though the work are closely related to the use case of this presentation, none of them directly address the task at hand. And so here is our proposition. Create a deep learning based active user detector for non-coherent channels. Our system model is the following. We have k users making the user set u that activate randomly according to a Poisson distribution of parameter lambda, creating an active subset a bar. Each user transmits its own Gaussian code word of m channel uses, and it's transmitted over a flat Rayleigh block fading channel with Gaussian noise, 
causing an average SNR of rho. The N antennas of the receiver then combine to make a received signal Y. To perform detection, the receiver only knows the codebook, the activity probability law, and the statistical SNR. The detection performance can be characterized by means of several metrics whose definitions are provided in this slide. The missed detection rates correspond to the false negative rate, and the false alarm rate to the false positive rate. The user error rates combine these errors to combine an average individual error rate, with theta being the mean activity probability of the system. In addition, the code set error rate is a system level error rate that counts the rate of non perfect code set detections. By its definition, the user error rate seems to better provide an accurate state of the detection performance. The accuracy of the detection is evaluated on a whole set, but are more fine grained metric, so it's of particular interest to our scenario. We now introduce some active user detectors, and we begin with an optimal one, the code set base map. Deriving the base risk with respect to the code set error rate, the optimal detector minimizes the probability that the detector subset A differs from the true active subset. That is, it maximizes the a posteriori probability of equation 6. The equations 7 and 8 detail the two terms, prior probability from the Poisson distribution and the a posteriori probability of y given the subset A. In this equation, stemming from the Gaussian nature of the received signal, y of n denotes the received signal on the antenna n, and sigma derives from the considered active subset A having cardinality omega via its associated code set CA. The singular value decomposition of this code set is given by V gamma U, with V and U complex unitary matrices, while gamma is composed of the singular value gamma I on its diagonal, which allow to define Y tilt N as the projection of Y N onto the code set CA space. From a user error rate perspective, the optimal detector is given by equation 10. The detected subset is defined as the union of the users for which the delta function equals 1. The delta function is detailed in 11, while the left term of the inequality corresponds to the misdetection cost and the right to the false alarm cost. The base station here performs a binary test for each user. It chooses the lowest cost independently. Thanks to the union in equation 10, it's then equivalent to minimizing the global user error rate. We can also note that for each user, the probability of misdetection and the false alarm are computed given all the subset of the power set phi. As was the case with the code set base map, the user base map performs an exhaustive search on the power set, so both have an exponential complexity with regards to the user set size. Now, for real-time implementation, the complexity of previously defined code set map and user base map is way too high. So, an iterative solution has been proposed to circumvent this computational cost, the IT map, iterative map. This one has a successive interference cancellation philosophy. It processes the received signal iteratively and retrieves the, a new detected user it processes the received signal iteratively and retrieves the new detected user at each iteration based on the assumption of the previous iteration. The search is thus restricted to some element of phi. More precisely, the evaluated subsets are built from the previously detected subsets. The IT map detector stops as soon as two successive iterations provide the same detected subset. Now, for the proposition of this presentation, the, the neural network estimator will take the received signal Y as input with the SNR level in dB and output the vector P, having values between 0 and 1, and that we will treat as the estimated probability that each node is active. The network is trained by comparing that output P and the true activity vector with a classical categorical cross-entropy loss function. After training, the soft probability vector P is then converted to a hard decision with a threshold of 0.5. Now, the choice of that loss function is quite important. 
we want to be able to say that we actually train the network to do what we want it to do. We note that in average, the loss value for a given user will be given by the sum of all the examples of the log of either the probability output for this user, if the user is part of the active set for this example, or of 1 minus that probability output. When the examples are selected according to the activity probability, the statistical average loss value will converge to the expected value over the possible active set and the received signals. And now we can derive the statistical average loss as an integration with regards to the received signal y. We then deduce that the statistical average loss for a user given a received signal y can be defined by means of the posterior probability. Minimizing this loss function then makes the elements of the vector p converge to the posterior probability. And this is also the objective function of the map algorithm. This one chooses the subset that maximizes the posterior probability, where here we minimize the opposite of that posterior probability. So the two approaches are equivalent. And this is why we call the setup a neural network map estimator. Of course, we have no guarantee that in the neural network will actually converge to the global optimum, but we can still conclude that the cross-entropy loss function is the right one for the user-based map task. After having verified that the proper loss function is used for training, one needs to actually design a neural network and decide on its parameters. The first one to choose is the type of the neural network. In this case, the observation vector is a combination of random Gaussian variables related to the properties of both the codebook, the channel realizations, and the noise. On top of that, the codebook is selected randomly. So this all means that we cannot expect any kind of correlation in the input data, either spatially or temporally. So convolutional and recurrent layers would not be really useful. And that is why a generic dense network is used. After choosing the architecture type, the size of the network needs to be set. For that, we first set the number of units in a layer to be proportional to the parameters of the system. So in this case, the number of users, of antennas, of enough channel uses. And then we train networks with different amount of layers and units. And in our case, the performance did not really improve above five layers and four times the parameter size. And Finally, the range of the SNR value used in the training simulation has a big impact on the final performance, and that's the topic of the next slide. But before that, a quick note, all the parameter tuning is done on the same scenario to be able to accurately compare the different runs, and the scenario is using 10 users, 8 channel users, and 4 antennas, with, in average, 4 active users. Okay, so, as I just mentioned, the SNR value used to train the network has a big impact on the way it trains. If it's too low, the input signal is so noisy that the network cannot learn anything. And if it's too high, the network won't have to learn how to cope with the noise, so it won't learn anything either. The way to handle this situation is to train on a range of SNR values, each, each example presented to the network having a random selection inside of the chosen range. And this graph presents the impact of that training range on the final network performance. In here, all the curves are from ranges centered on 10 dB and changing the width of the range. As you can see, the wider the range, the more the network is able to perform on various SNR levels. By the way, it's not presented here, but if the center value is moved to something other than 10 dB, the testing performance moves with it. One interesting aspect that you can actually encounter quite often when using something like an SNR value as input to your neural network is what happens when you present values outside what is shown at training. The red line is a great example for that. So at high SNR, in, the, in this case above 20, the performance drops significantly. That's because the network was not trained to handle a value of, say, 25 as its input. And to combat this effect, the simple solution is shown in the black line. In there, the value presented to the network is capped to the maximum and minimum values of the training range. Of course, the actual SNR value used in the simulation is not affected, only the network's input is changed. But, so as you can see, in the black line and at high SNR, no performance drop can be noticed with this technique. 
and for the next results, we chose to use the brown line with the results because it has the best performance over the range of SNR values we want to study, and it, it's not really necessary to use an even wider training range. Now that every neural network parameter has been chosen, it's time to present the results we can obtain from it. So here we have a comparison of all the three algorithms. We have the map in black, the iterative map in red, and the neural network in blue. We have on the left the cut set and user error rates, and on the right the false alarm and unbeast detection rates. We can see that the neural network particularly outperforms the iterative map algorithm at high SNR in all the four metrics, and it can get almost halfway to the performance of the optimal map algorithms. We can also note from the graph on the right that the iterative map and the neural network show a small difference on the false alarm to misdetection ratios. We have the iterative algorithm that has a focus on misdetection, the neural network focuses on the false alarm. And this is a trade-off that could be tuned on the neural network by biasing the loss function to favor one or the other if we need. Now, all the studied algorithms assume the knowledge of lambda, the actual number of active nodes. The map and IT map use it as a parameter of their computation, and the neural network learns it during training. But this expected value can be wrong in a real-world scenario, and it's interesting to see what a deviation from the expected number of active nodes affects the system's performance. And to see that we've set and trained a neural network and the IT map to work with lambda equals 4, and we test it with a fixed amount of active users. As you can see, the IT map outperforms the neural network only when there is only one active user, meaning that it has slightly less of a performance drop when the actual active user amount deviates far away from the expected value. To reduce this effect on the network side, we could either train it with several lambda values or use a more dist uniform distribution in the training. But this causes the risk of reducing the overall performance, so we have a trade-off here. And finally, we perform the same error rate study as before, but now with 20 potentially active users. In this scenario, due to the lonely on air increase in complexity, the non-interactive map algorithms cannot be computed in a reasonable time, so they are not included. And in this case, again, the neural network outperforms the iterative map, especially with regards to the user error rate that we consider to be more relevant to this scenario. In summary, we've seen that the neural network can outperform the IT map with up to 20 users, especially at high SNR values, and it also provides a trade-off regarding the errors in active user number estimation. The final performance aspect of this neural network is that it can compute faster than the iterative algorithm, and it also allows to compute batches of signal in parallel on a GPU, leading to an even quicker detection. To conclude this presentation, our contribution consists of a deep learning solution for the non-coherent active user detection problem based on a code domain non-orthogonal multiple access scheme. The proposed neural network is trained to minimize the user-based map cost function, leading to its naming of a neural network-based map. This NN map presents an improvement in performance over the state-of-the-art iterative algorithm combined with a reduction in execution complexity. This work could be extended by more tightly integrating the possible trade-off, such as the sensibility to the deviation of the amount of active users from the expected values into the loss function itself, and more importantly, to increase the scalability of the approach to more than 20 users. And this concludes this presentation. Thank you for your attention.
हेलो एवरी वन आई एम खुशबू सिन्हा फ्रॉम इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी निर्मा यूनिवर्सिटी इंडिया द टॉपिक ऑफ माई प्रजेंटेशन इज स्पेक्ट्रम सेंसिंग बेस्ड ऑन डायनेमिक प्राइमरी यूजर विद एडिटिव लैप्लाशन नॉइज इन कॉग्नेटिव रेडियो The outlines for this presentation are introduction, abstract of the research work, system model, performance analysis, result, conclusion, and references. Introduction. So this slide represents the general introduction to the basic concepts of cognitive radio and spectrum sensing. in the today's scenario of 5g communication scarcity of microwave spectrum is the biggest bottleneck for introducing real time services use of millimeter wave can provide enough spectrum but it demands for drastic change in the radio access network air interface physical layer and mac layer of cellular networks on the other side it has been observed that the microwave spectrum is not utilized effectively major part of this spectrum has been found vacant we call it as spectrum holes or sometimes as white space cognitive radio is a promising technology which focus to alleviate the spectrum scarcity problem in wireless communications by allowing access of unlicensed or secondary users to frequency bands that are assigned to licensed or primary user so that it doesn't affect the quality of services of the licensed network so uh, uh, i will be using the these terminologies like cr for cognitive radio su for secondary users and pu for primary user throughout my presentation so uh, the last point represents the uh, ge very general a uh, general basic definition of cognitive radio the process of detecting spectrum holes is known as spectrum sensing in cognitive radio so spectrum sensing is one of the function of uh, uh, cognitive radio the case of one transition of pu signal during spectrum sensing interval is considered in reference number 5 and 6 while multiple transitions of pu signal were considered in reference number 7 and 8 so basically uh, the conventional spectrum sensing methods like energy detection improved energy detection so uh, they used to consider the case of static primary user where primary users were assumed to be static during the sensing period that is during the sensing period pu uh, didn't change or uh, pu don't change while the dynamic scenario of the pu signal consider the dynamicity of the pu signal that is pu signals are liable to change within the sensing period that is within the sensing period for some samples for some sensing samples pu will remain active while for other sensing samples pu will remain inactive so uh, this is the general uh, case of dynamicity of the pu signal so the static scenario were considered in reference number 5 and 6 while the dynamic scenario are considered in reference number 7 and 8 as multiple access interference is perfectly modeled by laplacian noise as compared to other noise model we have used laplacian noise to model our considered system so as uh, from the reference number 9 what uh, what happens that uh, the multiple access interference which is generally caused in the environment of multi multiple users so in that very case when uh, we are having multiple users and we are having multiple access interference due to the interference of the signal uh, am among the uh, multiple users so the pdf of multiple access interference or the mai that is multiple access interference is perfectly modeled by the laplacian noise pdf while uh, the other noise models like uh, even the awgn additive void gaussian noise or the other non gaussian noise model like class a uh, uh, class a middleton noise model or gaussian mixture model 
so uh, these uh, noise model like gaussian mixer model or class a middleton noise model don't model doesn't model the uh, multiple axis interference very well so laplacian noise uh, model the multiple axis interference accurately as compared to other noise model like gmm gaussian mixer noise model or uh, the um, uh, class a middleton noise model so uh, that is why we are considering laplacian noise to model our uh, system abstract of the research work so uh, these uh, points uh, are the abstract of uh, the research work done by us spectrum sensing techniques with dynamic primary user are considered in the environment of laplacian noise we consider three different detection schemes such as energy detection absolute value accumulation detection and improved absolute value accumulation detection so the abbreviation of absolute value accumulation detector detection is abcd while for improved absolute value accumulation detection is iabcd we present the performance in terms of receiver operating characteristics which is basically the graph between the detection probability and false alarm probability pd versus pf and detection probability versus average signal to noise ratio using simulations <coughs> sorry we conclude that the detection performance in the dynamic scenario is better than the performance in the static scenario when the arrival departure parameter theta at or theta dt is bearing one where theta a theta d are corresponding to the arrival rate and departure rate of the view and t is the sampling interval so theta a t or theta dt collectively they uh, they denotes the number of arrivals of the primary user the last one denotes furthermore the i a b c d scheme outperforms a b c d and energy detection in the considered scenario so this is the last conclusion which uh, we got uh, in our work that improved a b c d outperform a b c d and the conventional spectrum sensing techniques energy detection in the considered scenario the system model for our work is under hypothesis h not the received sample at the cognitive terminal y this is equal to signal plus noise so sm denotes the primary user signal and wm is the laplacian noise and uh, ym is the received sample at the cognitive radio terminal at the receiver side so under for uh, the sample 1 to xi not the received sample at the cognitive terminal y this is equal to signal plus noise while for sample xi not plus 1 to n the received sample is noise so basically the transition are taking place from xi not to xi not plus 1 so under h not case from xi not to xi not plus 1 the pu is departing while under hypothesis h1 received sample at the cognitive terminal this is equal to wm for 1 to z for 1 to xi1 for samples 1 to xi1 received sample at the cognitive terminal is equal to wm wm denotes the laplacian noise while for sample xi1 plus 1 to n received sample at the cognitive terminal this is equal to signal plus noise while signal is actually the pu signal so from xi1 to xi1 plus 1 the pu signal is arriving second point for static pu environment both the case xi0 is equals to 0 and xi1 is equals to 0 as we can see from equation number 1 that when xi0 is 0 and xi1 is equals to 0 so uh, the h0 and h1 hypothesis denotes the problem of uh, static pu environment while for dynamic pu environment both xi0 and xi1 are less than n from reference number 4 so i have taken uh, we have taken a hint from reference number 4 for deriving the equation 2 so uh, from reference number 4 the likelihood function under null hypothesis h0 can be expressed as uh, given in equation number 2 similarly under h1 under hypothesis h1 the likelihood function can be expressed as 
given in equation number 3 in this slide. So, uh, the capital Y that is Y is actually an array of the received sample from 1 to n and SC1 is actually the samples from zeta xi1 plus 1 to sample n. So, basically uh, we are using GLRT generalized likelihood ratio test along with maximum likelihood estimate of SM because SM is unknown to us. So, we are using the ML estimation together with generalized likelihood ratio test. So, uh, the uh, ML estimate of SM is actually SM cap which is calculated and found to be YM. So, the manual estimation, the manual method or the manual estimation process is not shown in this slide. So, uh, SM can be uh, the uh, ML estimation of SM. PU signal it can be calculated using the general steps of ML estimation and is found to be SM is equals to YM and lambda in equation 4 is actually the detection threshold which we can obtain from the name and person test. So, finally simplifying the equation number 4 we get final expression as Z Z is equal to summation of mod of ym square from z0 plus 1 to n minus summation of mod of ym square from m is equals to 1 to xi1. So, lambda dash is, lambda dash is actually the final detection threshold which we get by simplifying equation number 4. So, z is actually the final test statistic for the energy detection. So, uh, it must be noted here that whatever the test statistic or whatever the steps which uh, uh, I am describing in the previous slides which I was describing in the previous slides that was for energy de detection. So, similar steps will be performed for ABCD and improved IABCD. So, for energy de detection the final test statistic Z or the final random variable z which is actually the test statistic for energy detection or which is actually the energy detection test statistic. So, the final expression of z it can be expressed as given in equation number 5 see uh, the detection probability p d and false alarm probability p f can be expressed using the expression given in equation number 6 that is p d is equals to probability of z greater than lambda dash upon h 1 and p f which is the false alarm probability this is equal to probability of z greater than lambda dash upon h naught where lambda dash is the detection threshold which can be obtained from the NP test or the Neyman person test. Probability of the random arrival or the departure in the zenoth or z1 sample is given by equation number 4 is given by reference number 4. So, I have taken the hint uh, from reference number 4 to derive the random arrival or random departure probability in the zenoth in, in the zenoth and xi1 sample. So, is expressed as given in equation number 7. So, energy detection based on static PU that can be finally expressed as random variable C which is equal to summation over 1 to n mod of minus square. Psi C is the detection threshold for the energy detection based on static PU. So, for the static PU xi0 and xi1 both are 0 in this case. So, applying central limit theorem we uh, can express C as normally distributed within mean m0 and variance sigma0 square. So, m0 is equals to 2 and b square where b is the shape parameter and sigma0 is equals to 2 root 5 and b square using equation number 9 psi c detection threshold can be expressed as in term of q function. So, psi c is equals to q inverse p f sigma naught plus m naught. So, dynamic so uh, this was for the static case. Now, for dynamic p u using equation number 5 and 7 average likelihood ratio can be obtained as taken uh, as the hint taken from uh, reference number 4. So, the dynamic PU using equation number 5 and 7 
the average likelihood ratio can be obtained as a is equal to summation over 1 to n 1 minus exponential over theta at m mod of m square mm -hmm. the detection threshold can be expressed in term of q function so uh, psi xi a psi a this is equal to q inverse pf sigma a plus mu a given an equation number 12 so this is the detection threshold for the dynamic pu case in energy detection the expression of mu and sigma a square is derived and can be expressed as given in equation number 13 so mu a and sigma a square is the mean and variance of <laughs> equation number 11 for random pu departure same process uh, is repeated as uh, done in the pu arrival case so uh, this was for the energy detection part where uh, for static case for the dynamic case and in the dynamic case we are having two cases of random arrival and departure so uh, we have obtained the test statistic or we have obtained the uh, test statistics uh, test statistic for each of the case in the energy detection for the static case for the dynamic case so similar uh, process can be repeated for abcd and iabcd and uh, for uh, abcd and iabcd so the expression can be represented as given in equation number 16 z is the improved iabcd based test statistic which can be represented as given in equation number 16 where p is the normal power or the exponent which uh, the range of uh, the range varies uh, between 0 and 2 that is the range is greater than or equal to 0 and uh, it is uh, less than 2 so for static pu the, the decision statistic under this case can represent similarly similar kind of expression which uh, we expressed for energy detection part so similar kind of expression we expressed in equation number 17 for the static scenario of the pu and for iabcd so uh, the same process is repeated as we did in ed case and uh, we can obtain the min and variance under static case and the dynamic case separately and we can find out the pd and pf in each case in term of q function so the mu naught and sigma naught square for uh, uh, the I ABCD keys that is represented as given in equation number 19. So the simulation results are the first figure it denotes the comparison of ROC plots for different test statistics with n is equals to 50, gamma is equals to minus 5 dB, theta AT is equals to 1 and theta DT is equals to 1. So gamma is actually the average SNR. So the first uh, simulation diagram it indicates that IABCD in the dynamic scenario perform better as compared to the ED and ABCD. So it must be noted here that the value of xi naught and xi1 are taken as 10 and 15 respectively in our case. So that is considered same throughout uh, the dynamic case of ABCD or IABCD or ED. So uh, this uh, uh, graph is shown for p is equals to 0 0.8 randomly. However, if we decrease the value of p, the simulation result will improve. While if we increase the value of p, the simulation result will decrease. The second figure it uh, denotes the case of uh, dynamic PU with ABCD, IABCD, and ED. So this is basically the PD versus average SNR comparison with n is equals to 50 false alarm probability 0 0.1 theta at is equals to 1 and theta dt is equals to 1 so here also this is uh, it denotes that the detection performance of iabcd is better as compared to ad and abcd the third expression is the pd versus pf plot at n is equals to 50 gamma minus 2 dv for randomly arriving or departing pu with abcd based test, test statistic for different values of theta at and theta dt so here we can uh, see that if when theta a t or theta d t is greater than 1 the detection performance improve while if it is less than 1 the detection performance it reduces 
similar kind of uh, uh, result is we uh, got in case of IABCD that is this uh, figure it denotes the PD versus PF plot at n is equals to 50, P is equals to 0 0.8, gamma is equals to minus 2 dB for randomly arriving or departing PU with IABCD based test, test statistic. So, here also uh, the figure uh, represents that the IABCD perform better as compared to the other uh, 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 I am sorry here also uh, the figure it denotes that the detection performance is better as the value of theta t and theta d t is greater than 1 while the detection performance reduce when the value of theta a t or theta d t is less than 1. And this is the graph of uh, ED based test statistic in the dynamic scenario as well as in the static scenario. So, uh, the similar kind of expression which uh, we have obtained for the ED case. So, uh, we have shown on uh, the 5 figures. The first figure is the comparison of the ROC plot for ABCD, IABCD and ED. The second figure is the PD versus SNR graph of the first figure. The third figure is solely for ABCD part. The fourth figure is for uh, solely for IABCD part and the fifth figure is solely for ED part. So, in all the cases we have obtained the PD and PF expression uh, and we tr uh, try to match and uh, we tried to uh, basically uh, compare the ABCD, IABCD and ED based test, test statistic and we uh, concluded that uh, the IABCD performed better as compared to the ED and uh, ABCD. So, the conclusion is in this paper we considered spectrum sensing schemes such as energy detection, absolute value accumulation detection and improved ABCD in the additive Laplacian noise environment. Further, we considered the dynamic uh, primary user by assuming its random arrival or departure in term of theta it or theta d t in the sensing interval. We present the performance using simulations in term of receiver operating characteristics and detection probability versus average SNR and we conclude that the performance with dynamic scenario with theta it and theta d t beyond 1 is better than the static scenario. So, these are the conclusion which uh, we obtained from uh, our work and is shown in the figure also. These are the references. Thank you. If you have any questions, then you can ask me. You are welcome to ask. Thank you.
Hi everybody, my name is Enrico Testi and I'm a third year PhD student of the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Information Engineering Guglielmo Marconi of the University of Bologna, Italy. In this work, we propose a tool for topology sensing of a non-collaborative packet-based wireless network using over-the-air signals captured by radio frequency sensors. The importance of networks is massively growing in modern-day society thanks to unprecedented communication capabilities offered by technology. In this scenario of ultra-densely connected objects, topology sensing is an essential aspect that can help predict traffic flow, infer communication between nodes, estimate the network connectivity, detect communities, help network maintenance and perform optimization and orchestration. From this perspective, while the current cognitive radio paradigm is grounded on spectrum sensing, more in-depth knowledge of how a network uses the wireless medium and the structure of the network itself may contribute to the development of much effective spectrum sharing strategies. The proposed framework aims to infer the topology of a non-collaborative network either because it is competing for the spectrum usage or it is private, encrypted and cannot be accessed. Thus, our method is performed from the outside of the network. Let us now describe two specific application scenarios in which our tool can be very effective. The first scenario is called Spectrum Awareness in Cognitive Radio. In this scenario, a primary wireless network wishes to know if another network is using the same spectrum, in a legitimate way or not. In this case, the wireless nodes schedule a periodic sensing phase to sense the RF medium. After sensing the spectrum, the nodes send the collected power samples to a fusion center that performs the topology inference. Once the topology is inferred, the wireless network can make decisions about the spectrum usage or perform communication optimization based on the adversarial network's behavior or notify spectrum regulators about violations by non-legitimate communications. A network of radio frequency sensors can be deployed in an unknown environment to detect and extract information about an adversarial network structure. The sensors collect over-the-air received power profiles and send them, again, to a fusion center, which can be either one of the sensors or a specific device. Again, it's the fusion center that performs the topology inference. The objective of this research is the development of a tool to perform topology inference in stealth mode by observing over-the-air spatial and temporal spectrum usage through simple RF sensors. Let us consider a scenario with a non-collaborative wireless network of N nodes and a network of M RF sensors randomly deployed on a two-dimensional landscape at known positions. Without loss of generality, the effect of shadowing between the nodes and the sensors is modeled by a log-normal distributed random matrix S. Then, assuming conventional energy detection, the thermal noise at the receiver, at the output of the integrator, can be modeled as a constant nu that can be added to each sample received. The profiles of the packets transmitted by each user are time series arranged as rows of the matrix P. Then the channel is represented by the mixing matrix H and the matrix of the received power profile X can be written as in the equation reported in this slide. For the sake of clarity, the noise term in the energy detector is a central key-squared random variable with a number of degrees of freedom proportional to the time bandwidth product. When the number of degrees of freedom is large, the noise term can be considered constant. 
As detailed in the paper, we consider a system with bandwidth equal to 20 MHz, for example a Wi-Fi channel, and an integration time equal to 10 microseconds. This implies a number of degrees of freedom of about 400 that is considered large. In this block scheme, we show the processing chain of our proposed topology inference tool. Firstly, we perform over-the-air spectrum measurements using RF sensors. Then, we use blind source separation to separate the traffic patterns generated by the nodes of the network. Finally, to infer the topology, we detect directed data flows among nodes by identifying causal relationships between the separated transmitted patterns. Blind source separation recovers the source signals from a set of observed quantities X when the mixing matrix is unknown. The signal separation can be effective if a preprocessing stage manipulates the data so that there are n mixtures centered and whitened at its output. Since we suppose that the number of network nodes n is unknown, in this stage we also estimate the number of sources. So, starting from the sample covariance matrix of the observations, we perform the eigenvalue decomposition. Then, to estimate the number of sources n hat generating the mixture, we use model order selection based on minimum description length criteria. Once the number of sources is estimated, we project the mixture onto the subspace spanned by the eigenvectors corresponding to the n hat largest eigenvalues, reducing the dimensionality from m, that is the number of sensors, to n hat, that is the number of estimated sources. Now, to perform the separation, we use independent component analysis, that is a data processing method that finds statistically independent components from data. In our settings, ICA is applied to X tilde to reconstruct the transmitted power profiles, that was P. Its output is an mixing matrix W that allows us to find Y tilde, that is the matrix of the separated components. Here we proposed a fast ICA, that is an iterative algorithm with kurtosis as a measure of non-Gaussianity and the correlation based on the Gram-Smith orthonormalization. However, the order of the recovered signals is not preserved. Thus, we can obtain the transmitted power profiles P starting from Y tilde, permutating its rows. Here we propose an iterative method to associate the reconstructed sequences to the nodes of the network. On this purpose, let us define the matrix D, whose elements, D, M, N, are the distances between sensor M and node N. First, we select a node N from a list of all the nodes of the network and find its nearest RF sensor M. Then, we correlate the sequence measured at sensor M with all the unmixed sequences that are the rows of Y tilde, separately. The row of Y tilde that shows the highest positive correlation peak is associated with N and is copied into the nth row of Y. Then we remove the considered node N from the list, we delete the considered row of Y tilde and iterate the algorithm. At the end it results that the complexity of this algorithm is big O of N hat log N hat, that is acceptable also when dealing with large networks. The signal unmixing is not perfect and this is because of the presence of noise and shadowing, so the output Y of the blind source separation has residual crosstalk that has to be removed. To remove this crosstalk we use an excision filter 
that uses a threshold to transform the reconstructed power profiles in sequences of zeros and ones arranged in the matrix Z. In particular, the elements of Z are 1 if the event packet sent is detected and 0 otherwise. To evaluate the performance of the BSS, we define the reconstruction error as number of wrong samples divided by the number of total samples reconstructed. The accuracy of the time series reconstructed is degraded by noise and shadowing, while the node source association could be affected by uncertainties of node positions. We model position uncertainty as a Gaussian distributed random variable with standard deviation sigma p added to both the coordinates of each node. To characterize the impact of the number of sensors on the performance of the source separation, we define the density of sensors, rho s, as the number of sensors per square meter. In the figure, we can see how the reconstruction error increases when sigma p gets higher, even at relatively high density of sensors. Moreover, the curves translate upward when the shadowing intensity increases. Now that we have obtained the reconstructed transmitted power profiles, we are going to talk about topology inference. The topology of a network is represented by a directed graph and its associated adjacency matrix A, which elements, A, I, J, are 1 if information flows from node I to node J and 0 otherwise. Our goal is to find an estimate of the adjacency matrix A hat of the wireless network from row RF measurements carried out by sensors within an observation window. So, we are going to find an instantaneous topology of the network. One of the most common tools used to find the topology of a network is the Granger causality test. The Granger causality test methods are based on linear autoregressive models. In particular, considering a pair of time series, Zi and Zj, two models can be formulated. The model 1 corresponds to hypothesis H1 and considers the possibility of a causal relationship between the two time series, while the second model is the null hypothesis H0 and excludes the contribution of the past values of Zi in the prediction of Zj. If Zi Granger causes Zj, the prediction error of model 1 is less than the one of model 2. On the other hand, if Zi has no causal influence on Zj, the errors are approximately equal. Usually, the Granger causality test is based on the squared sum of residuals and follows an F distribution. Another well-known method to measure the information flow between two random processes is the transfer entropy. Considering two time series, Zi and Zj, again, modeled as random processes, the transfer entropy from node i to node j can be expressed as the equation reported in this slide. In general, the evaluation of conditional probability densities requires the knowledge of infinite past samples of Zi and Zj. However, in this particular application, Transfer entropy is calculated considering only R and Q past samples of Zi and Zj respectively. The decision threshold, theta, is obtained by the null distribution of the transfer entropy, estimated from an appropriate manipulation of the time series, setting a predefined false alarm probability. A variant of transfer entropy called conditional transfer entropy, includes the effect of all the possible neighbors of two nodes in the measurement of the information flow between them. As figures of merit for the proposed topology inference methods, we have chosen the probability of detection and the false alarm probability of the links. Here, we compare the state-of-the-art methods for topology inference varying the density of wireless nodes per square meter, rho n. 
Note that increasing the number of nodes in the landscape leads to an increase in collision probability, which results in network congestion. The conditional transfer entropy method presents the lower false alarm probability, but the probability of detection is lower than the Granger causality method. Therefore, the error on the reconstruction impacts more transfer entropy than the other approach. In a realistic scenario, the quality of the reconstructed time series might be degraded by the presence of shadowing. In the figure, we show how increasing the sigma s in dB of shadowing degrades the accuracy of the algorithm, as expected. Even in this scenario, conditional transfer entropy presents a false alarm rate lower than the Granger causality method, but the probability of detection is still the lowest. In this work, we propose a novel framework for blind topology sensing of a non-collaborative wireless network whose key features are unknown. The framework consists of combining blind source separation, measurement association, excision filtering and topology inference. The topology inference is carried out using state-of-the-art causal inference methods such as Granger causality and conditional transfer entropy. The numerical results, accounting for packet collisions and realistic channel impairments, such as noise and shadowing, reveal that in this framework the topology inference of a wireless network is possible, and, as expected, those phenomena impact the performance of the algorithms because of the non-perfect reconstruction of the power profile of the transmitted signals at the nodes.
Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Pekka Ajanen. I work as a spectrum and regulatory expert consultant at Coworker Technology Finland. This study was done together with Seppo Yrjela. Today I will discuss the radio product authorization policies in the context of private 5G networks. While the standardization and development of technical solutions for 5G networks is progressing, less attention is being paid to the regulatory frameworks and especially the equipment authorization frameworks for the new industrial networks. This paper provides an overview of radio authorization for mobile communication networks and develops a conceptual framework to depict and analyze authorization policies. The fifth generation mobile network infrastructure aims at facilitating the digitalization of various vertical sectors such as the manufacturing, logistics, transportation, automotive and agriculture. The industrial use cases may be significantly different from those of public mobile networks, particularly related to network availability, security and privacy. In order to fully realize the, the benefits of 5G networks serving the different vertical sectors needs, there is an urgent need to allow the verticals themselves or external service providers to operate their own networks without direct mobile network operator involvement. If an industrial or private network is deployed by an organization other than current mobile license holder, it needs access to suitable spectrum. In addition to valid use cases and access to affordable spectrum, the timely availability of radio equipment is essential. Applicable radio equipment needs to be authorized in order to be placed on the market and be used. In this study, our analysis is based on the predecessors of the growth of business. Uh, that is the scalability referring to an internal growth potential and flexibility and replicability indicating external flexibility to adapt. In order to assess the scalability and replicability of the radio authorization approaches, the radio product test and certification processes and regulation in the 27 European Union countries and in 67 other countries have been studied. The countries were chosen based on their relevance for private mobile network business, cognitive radio spectrum management approaches and availability of detailed regulatory data. Special attention was paid to the US and the EU radio authorization frameworks, which are applicable to multiple countries globally. Data was collected both from public sources and directly from the national regulatory authorities. The key concepts and frameworks utilized in the study are concept of business model, radio spectrum requirements for private 5G networks and the radio equipment authorization processes. Business models can be seen to connect the, to three strategic elements. Opportunities to be explored and exploited, value to be created and captured, and advantages to be explored and exploited. Successful business models are considered to have three strategic consequences, scalability, replicability and sustainability. In this study, our analysis is based on the two predecessors of the growth of business, the scalability and the replicability. Most 4G spectrum bands have been made available for nationwide public mobile networks through competitive awarding that is auctions, and the same approach is dominating the 5G spectrum release. Only a few countries have yet introduced new novel regulatory frameworks to make spectrum available for individually authorized, locally deployed private 4G or 5G networks. In addition to, to valid use cases and access to affordable spectrum, the timely availability of radio equipment is essential. The proposed replicability and scalability assessment 
comprises of the standard standards and regulatory preferences shown in tables 1 and 2. Uh, in case of public mobile networks, the large size of the market and utilization of harmonized spectrum bands typically allows for economies of scale for equipment, while for private networks the business case is very different due to fragmented bands, specific technical and operational requirements, as well as due to limited in-country market size. Furthermore, the fragmentation of the bands and the associated technical and operational requirements is reflected in fragmentation of the radio equipment authorization requirements. Therefore, approaches increasing the geographical availability, that is replicability, and applicability, that is scalability, of the authorization frameworks have become important predecessors of successful business. Only locally authorized radio products are allowed to be placed on the market and be used. The radio equipment authorization is achieved by verified conformance to local requirements and regulations resulting in a certification issued by the local regulator or by a body authorized by the regulator. The radio authorization requirements and the approval and certification procedures vary by region and by country. This must be taken into account as there may be a need to go through extensive and very specific type approval testing processes in the target countries to obtain the certification. Moreover, the equipment authorization process can be very complex and time consuming, especially in case novel spectrum management frameworks are utilized. Product authorization may be achieved through type approval or by supplier's declaration of conformity. Most countries do require type approval of radio products to demonstrate the conformance. Type approvals may comprise of laboratory testing against the national technical requirements and standards and certification including product labeling. Tests may be required to be performed in-country. It is also possible that the type approval may be partly or completely based on submit submitted documents or that the document-based application process must be complemented by submission of product samples and verification of their performance. In the EU and certain individual countries, suppliers' declaration of conformity allows for placing the products on the market. The shown framework was developed to characterize radio product authorization. In the e European Union, the Radio Equipment Directive, the RED, provides the essential requirements for placing radio products on the market. The essential requirements address safety and health, electromagnetic compatibility, and the efficient use of the radio spectrum. All radio products in the scope of this directive and placed on the EU market must be compliant with the RED. The RED allows manufacturers to self-declare that their equipment meets the applicable ETSI harmonized standards, which at the same time indicates compliance with the essential requirements of the RED, and to affix the CE mark so that the equipment can be placed on the market in those countries where the ETSI harmonized standards apply. In the USA, all marketed electrical equipment require authorization. Intentional radiators, including radio transmitters, are required to be tested at an authorized test laboratory and the technical file reviewed by an independent body before a certificate is granted and details listed on the FCC website. The FCC has two different approval procedures for equipment authorization, certification and supplier's declaration of conformity. Telecom products having a radio transmitter are to be certified. The major difference between the FCC and EU radio product authorization processes is that the FCC process builds on testing at authorized testi test laboratory 
and certification granted based on application, while the EU process builds on manufacturers' self-testing and self-declaration of conformity. In other countries, the processes have similar elements. The radio authorization frameworks in the EU, in the US and in 66 selected countries were analyzed and the findings are summarized in the paper. The paper presents also in more detail as an example the main aspects of the radio authorization frameworks in nine countries together with relevant spectrum bands in those countries. The countries are Australia, China, Hong Kong, India, Japan, South Africa, Canada, Mexico, Argentina. The countries were selected based on private network opportunities, novel spectrum management approaches, and different authorization frameworks. Well, I will not go to those individual countries in this presentation. I will just share the overall summary of the findings. Please take a look at the paper for more details. Summary of findings. In all countries, only locally authorized radio products are allowed to be placed on the market and, and be used. That's very clear. The application process is typically country-specific and involves submission of forms and other national documents, often in the local language, interaction with different authorities, usually at least with the local regulator, and payments. Most countries require type approval of radio products to demonstrate the conformance to national requirements and standards. The study shows that type approval and certification is required in 40 countries. In the European Union and certain individual countries such as Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, suppliers, of, suppliers declaration of conformity allows placing the products on the market. A local applicant is required at least in 30 non-EU countries. In-country laboratory tests are required in 14 non-EU countries. Product labeling is required in, in 38 countries and the EU 27. The validity period of product approval is unlimited in the EU and 36 other countries, while in 27 countries the validity periods vary between 1 and 5 years. In many cases, the national standards refer to a few key technical and operational requirements, which usually have similarities to ITUR requirements. For example, for ITU Region 1 countries, that is countries in Europe, Middle East and Africa, uh, the spectrum allocations and many of the spectrum related requirements are very similar. Thus, the technical requirements may be similar to European requirements and the results of product tests based on the ETSI standards are valid in many countries also outside of Europe, especially in the Region 1 countries. The same applies to the IT Region 2, the Americas. Especially in the Latin American countries, the national spectrum use and the related requirements have similarities to the US spectrum use and FCC requirements. Therefore, the national technical requirements in many countries globally have similarities to or are identical with ETSI or FCC frameworks and requirements. On the other hand, in most countries, the ETSI or FCC product authorizations are not sufficient as such for local product authorization. However, it is possible to utilize EU ETSI documentation in the radio authorization process in 38 countries outside of the EU and the FCC documentation in eight countries. A prerequisite for this is some degree of commonality between the local technical requirements and applicable standards and the ETSI or FCC requirements. The figures here shows uh, global replicability of FCC and EU authorization test results in the countries addressed 
in this study. And then the conclusions. To date, only a few countries have introduced novel spectrum management frameworks for making spectrum available for locally deployed private LTE or 5G networks. Furthermore, the spectrum bands and the technical and operational requirements vary by, by country. As the use cases, bands and markets of private networks are fragmented and limited in size, the diversity of the product authorization frameworks is an issue and the replicability and scalability of existing frameworks become important. Utilization of harmonized, widely employed frequency bands and the associated technical requirements widen the replicability of the radio authorization frameworks. This can be further enhanced by mutual recognition of product testing between the countries. By employing similar technical and operational requirements to those of the FCC or EU, the scalability and replicability of the radio authorization frameworks can be further increased, leading to economies of scale. Uh, variety of spectrum bands and fragmentation will keep increasing in 6G, which, which calls for novel approaches in spectrum management and product authorization. With rapid technology developments and business-driven needs, the timely network deployment is essential and calls for more dynamic and forward-looking radio product authorization strategies. This concludes my presentation. Thank you.
This presentation is given by Krzysztof Cichoń from Poznan University Technology. And the topic of my speech is uh, efficient clustering schemes towards information collection. The agenda of my talk is the following. First, I'm going to uh, introduce system model. Then I would like to uh, describe the considered clustering algorithms in my article. Um, then uh, I will say a few words about energy usage model, including uh, reporting power, which is pretty important in the model. Um, the main part of my talk is the deep view into the simulation results considered um, in this work. And then finally, I will draw a few conclusions. The model considered in the article is the following. Um, there is a network uh, of nodes um, described here uh, by the by this course. So there are a few nodes in the network. And then uh, these nodes, uh, they uh, sense the signal and they want to make a global decision. They want to exchange um, the data between uh, each other. And uh, the global probability of detection is given uh, here by the, by the formula on the, on the right. And it depends on the local uh, PDs, uh, which is the local probability of detection. And this is, um, well, simplify, we could simplify the quality of uh, detection by this uh, PD. In other words, um, we have uh, the primary user, which is uh, the transmitter of the license signal. And then we have a set of uh, nodes, a set of secondary users, which uh, cooperate in, in order to um, exchange the information and in order to make a global decision. And here there's an example of clustering where we have three clusters with three clusters, uh, th three cluster heads, CH1, CH2, CH3, and uh, they collect the information from the secondary users and then send the information to Fusion Center, which is the central entity for uh, global decision-making. Here in this slide, I have shown uh, three basic uh, well-known attitudes uh, to the efficient network organization. So we have the centralized scheme. Uh, we have hierarchical scheme with um, clusters. So we have three levels of nodes, uh, secondary user, which is the normal node, then the first level uh, cluster head and the second level uh, fusion center. And in C, we have also distributed algorithm where uh, the nodes collect information from their neighbors. Uh, in this uh, work, I focus on uh, case B, on the clustering schemes. However, I have also some reference cases introducing mainly case A. The first considered algorithm in my work is the standard k-means algorithm, which is uh, pretty well known. It has two uh, phases. The first step is the assignment step where each node selects the closest centroid for a, given, um, for a given node. Then we have the update step uh, when uh, for each cluster we define a central point, which is the artificial point. It's not the real um, node. And then we redefine uh, the cluster, um, redefine it as cluster centroid. Um, so we can also use here the error sub k uh, and responsibility, which is binary. One means the node belongs to the cluster and zero means the node does not belong to the cluster. In the update step for the um, uh, given cluster, we have the, um, the following uh, formula for finding um, the nodes in the cluster. Uh, then here I have um, exemplary um, distribution of nodes and the squares, stars and um, crosses, they mean uh, different clusters. Uh, the circles mean uh, the uh, starting positions of uh, the 
of the central points in the clusters. So they simply, they are uh, the, the, the means of the clusters. And then we have the assignment and update step and you could, could observe how the um, central means of the clusters, they change their position. And uh, after a few iterations, uh, the nodes uh, change uh, the clusters. You could observe this here for um, some border nodes. In the um, extended version of k-means, uh, we have a soft k-means algorithm where the, each node could uh, belong uh, to the more than one cluster. And then the responsibility is not binary, it is uh, continuous and it is um, found on the base of the theta parameter, which is the crucial parameter in soft k means scheme, which is the stiffness. And then based on the stiffness, um, we could uh, exchange, we could extend the range of a given cluster and uh, exchange the range uh, of how many nodes will be taken into the um, into given cluster. Then in the update step, uh, which is the same as in the standard k-means, we also want to find um, uh, which nodes uh, belong to the clusters. And here uh, I have shown a few results uh, of uh, clustering for the same distribution of nodes with a given um, a stiffness values. So you could observe that uh, the smaller the stiffness, the greater the, uh, well, let's say range of the, of the cluster. Um, so here you have uh, multiple uh, values of stiffness. Of course, it's not, it's uh, the illustration. I mean, the circle is the illustration. It's not the real range. It's only uh, the illustration, how it works. Then the third algorithm considered in my article is k-medoids. Uh, here, different than in k-means, um, the location of the medoid is uh, always the position of the real node. It is not possible um, that, like in k-means, uh, uh, the, mean, the means of the cluster was, uh, could be, was artificial. Then the central point of the cluster is selected on the base of the closest distance to the remaining potential cluster members and the procedure uh, works in the iterative manner and it is conducted for every uh, cluster, for every network member. Then the fourth uh, one, the fourth algorithm used is a DB scan. It's a density based approach, which is not based on the number of clusters, which is known um, uh, in the algorithm a priori, which is known before start of the algorithm has to be selected here. The number of clusters is the result of the algorithm. It's, it, it is not uh, specified at the beginning of the algorithm. However, instead, uh, two other uh, parameters are important. The first one is the epsilon, which is um, the radius of the neighborhood. Um, under the consideration, it's a little bit similar to the stiffness in the soft k-means. And then the second crucial parameter is the minimum cluster size, um, which constitutes in the algorithm the cluster. So um, the neighbors are found within the epsilon neighborhood. If the number of neighbors is lower than minimum cluster size, uh, then uh, these nodes become the so-called noise nodes. Uh, so they are not within the cluster. Uh, otherwise, they form the cluster, of course, um, following the minimum cluster size parameter, and they become cluster nodes. Um, cluster could be extended after uh, the procedure is repeated um, for many iterations, and the border members uh, could uh, become um, the new member of clusters or the clusters uh, could be joined within this procedure. And here uh, I have shown uh, all algorithms together, then again for the, um, the same distribution of nodes in the simulation area, which is 50 meters per 50 meters. You could see um, the exemplary, of course, results of uh, these uh, four techniques with uh, the different um, shapes. 
um, I have shown different cluster members. So uh, this is the result of soft k-means, then k-means uh, db scan. And db scan, you could observe there, there is more than four uh, shapes. It's one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, uh, simply these three um, cluster members, they are noise nodes because they have not um, formulated the clusters since at least three nodes uh, within epsilon um, radius uh, can constitute the cluster. So that's why they are noise nodes. Here we have uh, two nodes within a given distance. Uh, however, at least three uh, can constitute the clusters, the cluster. Uh, so fortunately it is fulfilled and for the triangle cluster as well as for the um, um, cross cluster. In the k medoids, uh, we have also different uh, result of the uh, clustering. Of course, in many cases, simulation cases, uh, the procedures could give uh, the similar or, or even the equal results of the clustering. This case was particularly interesting for me since uh, the results were pretty different. Um, now I would like to uh, say a few words about the system models, about the energy use in the system. Mm, so the main figure of merits is the uh, total energy spent in the network and uh, the sensing uh, power uh, plays here important role as well, the processing power and the transmission power. And uh, what's more, we have also the network perspective in the model where we take into account uh, the uh, energies uh, of the single nodes as well, the energy uh, for the um, fusion and for the broadcast uh, in, within the network. The most important probably metric is the reporting link energy. So how much the node uh, spends energy for the reporting, of course, the longer the, longer the reporting link, then uh, the, usually the higher um, power is spent here. So my model is uh, described here where, we, where, it is in, where it is dependent from the distance from the IF node to the cluster head for this case. And then for the um, uh, noise uh, power, then for the target um, uh, signal to noise ratio, also to gains of the antennas GT and GR. Uh, lambda is, of course, the wavelength. And eta i is the uh, multipath uh, fading coefficient introduced also in the model. This is. Uh, uh, the random uh, value here within a, a given um, distribution. Then uh, before I present the results, I would also mention two reference cases. The first one is the M nodes with greatest detection probability, uh, which is simply the um, signal to noise ratio. It is called also in the plots that these nodes are with the greatest signal to noise ratio. However, the greater the, the, the SNR, the greater detection probability. And the size of the square simply means uh, what was the SNR signal to noise ratio received by the given node. And of course, this SNR is uh, valid for the primary to secondary user link. So how uh, good is the signal received by the node, the signal from the primary user. Then the second uh, reference case is the uh, M node selected with the lowest energy usage in the reporting link. These are usually the closest nodes. However, due to uh, the multipath coefficient, uh, it is possible that some of them, they are not the closest. Um, DB scan algorithm, the energy usage uh, for this algorithm for the epsilon values starting from 10 to 16 and for uh, two reference cases. So you could observe that um, uh, the reference cases uh, usually they offer um, higher energy usage than the DB scan algorithm with the small exception of the DB scan of the, um, sorry, um, of the SNR base selection, which is um, um, here quite uh, similar to the DB scan algorithms. And then um, 
with the increasing number of nodes, you could observe uh, the different value of epsilon gives the smallest uh, energy usage. Uh, the greater the number of nodes, uh, the smaller epsilon uh, should be since we have um, the constant uh, simulation area. So the nodes simply, they are become closer with the increasing number of nodes. Uh, and then the number of nodes, uh, which is the simply the number of clusters, the number of few of nodes reporting to Fusion Center. This is the number of clusters. It's uh, of course in DB scan, it's uh, changing. So I also draw uh, how many clusters we have in these algorithms, and you could observe that the smaller the value of epsilon, the greater the number of clusters. Um, uh, the, the greater number of reporting nodes, uh, which includes number of clusters and number of um, and noise nodes also. Um, then we have uh, the K-Medoids uh, results. Uh, here, uh, the smallest energy usage is observed for the uh, K-Medoids with four or five um, clusters. So the reference cases are far away in terms of energy usage from the um, the algorithm and K means uh, the lowest energy usage is observed for uh, also four, uh, three, four or um, five uh, clusters and it depends on the number of nodes it's uh, slightly increasing with the number of nodes and soft K means uh, these results are similar Mm, so three, four, or five clusters uh, gives give the smallest number, the smallest used energy mm, in the system. And uh, when we compare all algorithms together, this is pretty important plot. We could observe that uh, for a soft K means with four clusters, the spent energy in the network is the smallest. The second one, the um, K means with also K for clusters gives us the second uh, best energy usage. The third is the K-Medoids and the fourth is DB-SCAN. The reference cases uh, are, uh, uh, well, they offer a higher energy usage. Uh, what is important, the number of reporting nodes for um, K-Means uh, also in, in K medoids, it is um, constant. It is equal to four. K is four. However, in DB scan, it's changing. So I plot here the uh, number of reporting nodes for epsilon fourteen. In the reference cases, uh, all nodes, all possible nodes, uh, report to Fusion Center, and it is increasing the number of reporting nodes, and it is plotted here. So we could compare how many nodes from the group. Uh, directly uh, transmit signals to Fusion Center. And uh, well, there is a huge gap between these algorithms. And finally, also we can uh, see that the quality of detection is um, unchanged in all uh, considered uh, algorithms in soft K-means, K-means, uh, DB scan and K-medoids. For the reference cases, it is uh, slightly lower since um, not all network members are introduced to spe spectrum sensing. Moreover, what is quite well known in the literature, with the increasing number of nodes, the global probability of detection increases. Finally, uh, the conducted simulations have shown the lowest energy usage is observed for soft K-means scheme. That's the first conclusion. The second one for K-means, the energy usage is higher, but low complexity is here a great advantage and the soft and standard k-means both offer the energy usage which is not growing rapidly with the number of nodes in the network. Uh, thanks uh, for your attention. Uh, this is the conclusion of my talk.
Hi, I am Andrei Garnev. Let me present ongoing research on how different type of incomplete information might impact on design of anti jamming strategies. Various networks are susceptible to malicious attacks, especially those involving jamming. Fire control in jamming scenarios involves at least one user transmitter and at least one advisory jammer. Each of them has own objective. That's why M theory has been widely used to study such problems since it supplies suitable concept of solution for such multi-objective problems. One of them is Nash equilibrium, which is used in scenarios with complete information, where each of the players select simultaneously one strategy from the corresponding set of feasible strategies. Optimize its payoff. The other concept is Bayesian equilibrium, which supply a generalization of mesh equilibrium to the case of incomplete information the player can have about each other. The most related work to this work are the following. First of them is a work by Jan Viscasers, where a power control problem was investigated with complete information on network parameters. In the work by Jay with uh, Casters, a power control problem with global incomplete information for most players was considered. While in my recent work with Casters, the problem where one of the players does not have access to local information about only one of the rival's parameters was studied. This paper is the other step into this research. Namely, we can see the scenario where the player have non-symmetric access to combined local information. Specifically, the user does not have access to local information about the gain of the jammer's channel, reflecting the distance from the receiver to the jammer, and the cost of jamming power unit, reflecting technical characteristics of the jammer. While the jammer has access to all such local information. The problem is modeled by Bayesian game and multi-dimensional system of the best response. Equation to fight equilibrium is reduced by a fixed point equation of one scalar variables. Uniqueness of equilibrium is proven based on established monotonous relation between equilibrium strategies. The suggested algorithm to find equilibrium can be considered as a learning algorithm system allows to reduce the zone of uncertainty for equilibrium by a half hour iteration. In this paper, we consider the communication between a source, user, and the destination receiver in the presence of an advisory. The advisory is a jammer who intends to degrade the user communication by generating interference. Communication occurs on a single carrier and the channel is assumed to be flat fading. We assume that the user does not have access to local information about the gain of the jammer channel, affecting the distance from the receiver to the jammer, and the cost of jamming power units reflecting the characteristic of the jammer. But the jammer has access to such local information. Namely, the user knows that the gain of the jammer channel to the destination can be one of n possible values, and this gain can occur with known a priori probabilities. Similarly, cost of jamming power units can be one of n possible values, and this cost can occur with known a priori probabilities. The strategy of the user is its transmission power pin. Let us associate a type of jammer per a set of its characteristics. We will say that the jammer is of type ij if its characteristics are indexed by i and j. A strategy of each jammer type is applied jamming power. We also index strategy of each jammer type by indexes of its characteristics. That each jammer type have complete information about all possible network parameters and the a priori probability 
as well as its own type, but the user does not know the type of the jammer it faces. And the payoff for the user is given as the difference between expected throughput and transmission cost. The cost function of the corresponding jammer type is the sum of the user throughput and jamming cost. The user wants to maximize its payoff, while each jammer type wants to minimize its cost function. So we look for a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Recall that Bayesian Nash equilibrium is set of such strategy that each player has no motivation to divert from equilibrium strategy if the other player implements equilibrium strategy. Since the payoff of the user is concave on P, while cost function of each jammer type is convex in jamming power, the game has at least one equilibrium. To establish its uniqueness and so stability of the system, as well as to design equilibrium, we will use a constructive approach. Recall that the definition of equilibrium set of strategy is equilibrium if and only if each of them is the best response to the other. So the solution of best response equation. In our situation, we have n by m plus one best response equation. Following constructive approach, we will directly solve uh, this best response equation. To solve this best response equation, we find derivative of the user payoff and jammers uh, payoffs with respect to uh, transmission power and jamming power respectively. Here, LU is derivative of the expected user throughput with respect to user transmission power, while LG is the negative of the derivative of the user throughput for a specific value of jammer channel gain with the respect to jamming power. It's clear that derivative of the expected user throughput with respect to the user transmission power is decreasing in user transmission power as well as jamming power of each jammer type. While negative of the derivatives of the user throughput with respect to jamming power is increasing in user uh, transmission power and decreasing in jamming power of the corresponding jamming type. These monotonous properties allow us to establish the condition when the corresponding derivatives of the user payoff and uh, jammer type cost function can be equal to zero and establish monotonous properties of the corresponding roots. Namely, if transmission cost unit is enough large, then derivative of the user's payoffs with respect to user transmission power is always negative. Otherwise, for each set of jammer type strategy, there is the unique transmission power where this derivative is equal to zero and this root is decreasing on jamming power. Similarly, if jamming cost unit for a jammer type is enough large, then derivative of uh, this uh, jammer type cost function uh, with respect to jamming power is always positive. Otherwise, for each user transmission power, there is the unique jamming uh, power of the corresponding jammer type, where the derivative equals to zero, and this root is increasing on user transmission power. What's very important is that uh, P as function of J and J as function of P are monotonous in opposite direction. Combining this result, we can derive the best response strategy. This best response strategy implies that if the user is non-active, so its transmission power equal to zero, then each jammer type also is non-active. The user is non-active if user transmission cost unit is enough large. Otherwise, the user is active and some of the jammer might be active and might be not active. To find the user optimal strategy, we have to substitute all n by m jammer best response strategy into user best response strategy. It leads to a fixed 
point equation of one scalar variable, transmission power. What's important, the right side of this equation is decreasing in P by the proven above monotonous properties. While its left side, of course, is increasing P since it's just a linear function in P. Thus, the fixed point equation has the unique root and it can be found via the section method. To define which jammer type can be not active, we have to do further investigation. Note that the equation presented in jammer type best response strategies are quadratic one uh, on jamming power. This uh, equation can be solved in close form, what allows to identify the condition when all the uh, jammer type are non-active while user is active. Moreover, substituting uh, this best response strategy into the condition that derivative of the user payoff in respect to uh, uh, user transmission power has to be equal uh, zero, turn this condition into a water feeling equation uh, in respect to uh, user uh, transmission power and can be solved easily using uh, bisection method also. When defined, let us uh, now illustrate the derived strategy by example with n equal m and m equal two. Note that the first jamming cost in the considered uh, example is smaller than the second one. Thus, an increase in a priori probability alpha one that the jammer has smaller jamming cost leads to a decrease in applied transmission power. Such a decrease in transmission power of the user allows the jammer also to reduce its jamming power. Further, since first jammer channel gain is greater than uh, the second one. An increase in beta one, which can be interpreted as the probability of the jammer being located closer to the receiver, leads to a decrease in transmission power applied by the user, and in turn allows the jammer to reduce its jamming power. Finally, note that if a jamming strategy achieves zero due to either an increase in fading gain or an increase in jamming cost, it stays at zero with further increase in this characteristic. This phenomenon is similar to the one which can be absorbed in water filling equation for of dam transmission, where if the transmitted signal on a subcarrier is zero, it remains to be zero with further this decrease in total transmission power. Let me conclude uh, my presentation as follows. A Bayesian game monitoring a power control problem in a single carrier communication system with non symmetric access to combined local information the player can have has been studied. Multi dimension system of the best response equation to fight equilibrium has been reduced to a fixed point equation one uh, scalar variable. Uniqueness of equilibrium has been proven with the reflexibility of the system. The suggested algorithm based on the bisection method to design this fixed point can be considered as a learning algorithm since it allows to reduce the zone of uncertainty for the equilibrium by a half per iteration. Many thank you for your attention.
Hello everyone. Welcome to my presentation demonstrating spectrally efficient asynchronous coexistence for machine type communication, a software defined radio approach. My name is Surang Handagala and I'm from Northeastern University in Boston, USA. And this work is co authored by my PhD dissertation advisor, Professor Miriam Lisa. This is an outline of my presentation. I'm going to give an introduction to this topic and then I'll be speaking about the challenges that you need to address and also the contributions of this work. Then I will discuss the software defined radio based platform that we have developed and how we use this platform for asynchronous waveform coexistence studies. Then I present some simulation level and hardware experimental results. And finally, I conclude this presentation with possible future work. This figure shows the number of IoT devices that are expected to be connected to the internet in the next few years. Now we are in 2020 and we start to see an exponential increase in the number of those devices and we can expect uh, more than 20 billion IoT devices by 2025 which is more than three times higher than the number that we uh, saw in 2018. With this many connected devices, what are the challenges that we have to face? The wireless spectrum is already congested uh, with many services available for commercial and non-commercial use. Uh, the question comes as to how we manage the spectrum in an efficient manner. Orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or OFDM has been chosen for 5G physical layer because of its advantages like uh, spectral efficiency and resilience to frequency selective fading. However, there are some concerns when we talk about OFDM. Uh, it is not very robust against asynchronous interference which is likely to happen in machine type communication situations. We will need to consider how multiple channels can coexist when they communicate in an asynchronous manner. Various research has been done to quantify the effects of asynchronous interference, most of which are analytical and we cannot see a system level implementation that accounts for various real world impairments of a communication system, such as noise and channel effects. In this work, we provide a system level implementation of an FPGA or field programmable gate array based platform that we can use for coexistence experiments. We have implemented spectral shaping filters at the receiver side to improve the spectral efficiency of the baseline OFDM and we uh, have also demonstrated the coexistence of filtered channels with legacy channels. We also support higher order modulations like 256 QAM. The platform we use in these experiments consists of three parts. A transmitter which transmits the desired signal, an interferer and the receiver. Most of the implementation specific details of the platform have been discussed in the IEEE access paper that we published earlier this year. So if you would like to know how we do various uh, operations like signal synchronization and channel estimation in LTE signals, I encourage you to read the paper. Uh, speaking about the platform, we have analog devices AD9361 FMCOMS3 transceivers for transmitting and receiving signals. At the receiver side, we have Silings ZZ706 evaluation board, which has a Silings FPGA, which we use to process received signals. So why do we use this platform? We can do uh, all the experiments and we can process um, signals in real time because we use the FPGA. And more importantly, we can control various parameters such as signal power, 
and guard bands using software. Analog Devices has provided an API called Libio, which we can use to write to AD9361 device registers and control various parameters depending on our requirement. This is how our receiver chain looks like. We receive two signals, the desired signal and the interference. The analog devices AD9361 platform uh, performs preliminary signal processing like downsampling and decimation and we get a digital baseband signal sampled at the LTE sampling rate uh, which in this case is 30.72 mega samples per second. Then that output is passed to the FPGA where we do operations like synchronization, channel estimation and equalization in real time uh, to get the symbols. Then we pass these symbols to MATLAB uh, to calculate error vector magnitude and bit error rate of the received symbols. Back to our topic, uh, how do we achieve synchronization in LTE? Let's say we have two user equipment or UEs that are transmitting. They may not transmit in a synchronous manner However, when their transmitter signals arrive at the base station side, these signals are synchronized uh, to each other. How is that possible? The base station uses MAC layer timing advanced control signals to ensure that all users are synchronized at the base station side. This setup is okay for a subscriber oriented situation, but uh, what if we have like hundreds of thousands of devices connected like in IoT? It's going to be very hard to maintain synchronization between devices and the signaling overhead is going to be very high. So we need asynchronous communication in such situations. In our platform, we can consider the interference to be asynchronous for all practical purposes. So we use it to demonstrate uh, the effects of asynchronous interference. This plot shows how the error vector magnitude of the received symbols changes when the interference signal has different relative offsets to the desired signal. We can see three regions in this plot. Uh, that is the interference signal has a large negative time offset, a large positive time offset, both of which corresponds to the asynchronous communication scenario. And the third situation is that the offset is less than some threshold, which we call the synchronous situation. We use LTE signals in this experiment for both uh, desired and interference signals. When we calculated the error vector magnitude for different time offsets, we notice higher error vector magnitude in the asynchronous region. So our goal is to have low error vector magnitude in the asynchronous region for which we use uh, spectral shaping. We have considered two spectral shaping techniques, uh, filtering and windowing. We noticed that both techniques have high out of band interference suppression capability. These methods can be applied in either transmitter or uh, receiver or in both, uh, both ends depending on the application requirements. If we use the same enhancement technique at both ends then we call that the transmitter and the receiver are meshed. But it's not mandatory to use the same processing technique at both ends. The requirement at the transmitter side is to suppress out of band energy and the requirement at the receiver side is to limit the energy that is coming into the desired signal band. Speaking of these two techniques, both were found to be very effective in suppressing out of band energy of OFDM, but we, we are more interested at the receiver side as opposed to the transmitter side. 
and what is important at the end of the day is to have low error vector magnitude at the receiver. This plot shows the error vector magnitude values we got for non-filtered, filtered and windowed OFDM waveforms at the receiver side when the signal to noise ratio is 30 dB and the interference power is as same as that of the desired signal. What you notice is that the async, in the asynchronous region, filtered OFDM outperforms both uh, non-filtered and windowed OFDM in terms of the EVM. So for our hardware implementation, we selected filtered OFDM. These figures show the results we got for hardware experiments using real-time baseband processing. In the first case, the interference power is as same as the desired signal power. In the second case, the interference power is 10 dB higher than the desired signal power. In both cases, we see that uh, filtering has decreased the receiver side EVM. When the interference power is high, we see that non-filtered OFDM shows very high increase in EVM compared to filtered OFDM. Therefore, filtering is useful to keep a low error vector magnitude value under heavy interference. We also notice that the benefit we get by filtering diminishes when we increase delta F, which is the guard band between the two channels. These are the two constellations we got for non-filtered and filtered OFDM when the interference power is 10 dB higher than the desired signal power. The error vector magnitude in the non-filtered case was about 4% and in the filtered case was about 2%. When we talk about spectral enhancement techniques, one might ask the question, is it really possible for the spectrally enhanced channels to coexist with legacy channels? We can think of multiple possible com combinations when it comes to deployment. For example, we can think of having a legacy transmit channel and an uh, adjacent interferer with improved spectral shaping. This interferer is less likely to significantly affect the receiver side EVM because filtering removes most of its out of band energy. In a similar manner, we can think of an interference coming from legacy channels to new channels. So there are multiple possibilities that we can think of. This plot shows bit error probability values that we got for some of these combinations. In the legend, uh, L stands for a legacy and F stands for a spectrally enhanced or filtered. The order of these letters are, the first letter is the transmitter, the second one is the interferer, and the third one is the receiver. What we see from the plot is that the closest line to the baseline OFDM with no interference is LFF, which means that we can, uh, if we can coexist a uh, spectrally enhanced interference channel with a legacy transmitter, we can use a spectral enhancement at the receiver to improve the bit error rate value. We also see using spectral enhancement for all three, that is transmitter, interferer and receiver also gives us a good bit error rate that is comparable to the baseline situation. The take home message here is that we can calculate bit error rate requirements depending, depending on the application and determine how to use spectral shaping techniques to meet the performance criteria of a system. Now for example, uh, these are hardware experimental results we got for two cases LLL and LFL when the interference power is as same as the desired signal power. In LFL case, the error vector magnitude is lower than that in LLL. 
uh, which means that new channels can coexist with legacy channels better than legacy channels coexist with themselves. In conclusion, uh, designing communication systems for future applications is challenging and we have to think of efficiently using uh, the spectrum and supporting IoT. OFTM or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing which has been selected for 5G has advantages but need enhancements to support multiple channel coexistence in asynchronous communication scenarios. We came up with a system level demonstration of a software defined radio based test bed which we can use to perform coexistence studies. Um, it supports real-time processing, high order constellations, and we have implemented spectral shaping filters to enable waveform coexistence. And we have demonstrated some practical use cases as well. In the future, uh, we plan to make this work public by submit, submitting to GitHub and MATLAB Central. A possible future work is to use Sidings RFSOC, which is a more powerful evaluation platform. Uh, we, uh, and we can try out some advanced filtering techniques such as filter bank multi-carrier. And we can also think of some practical applications like implementing the decoder and doing video playback under asynchronous interference. I would like to acknowledge Silings, Analog Devices and MathWorks for supporting us with hardware and software tools and also National Science Foundation for funding this research. Thank you.
So yes, I'm happy to share actually this ORCA um, demo or showcase session because ORCA is all about experiments and demos and showcases. It's not about pen and paper research, but prototypes that you can hold in your hands. Yeah, unfortunately, because of the current pandemic, it will not be possible uh, to show the demos in real life. And you will all not be able to block the wireless link to create interference and see it can be detected or to test your own personal Doppler profile by walking in front of a radar. So it's actually a pity, but I'm also happy to say that our showcase leaders, or four showcase leaders, have done a very good job in preparing a very nice and short presentation and also a fantastic video. So that's what we will present you today. But uh, it is now my time. You are muted, uh, Sophie. You are muted since the last 10 seconds. You accidentally muted yourself. So you did not hear anything? No, no, we only missed the last uh, 15 oh, seconds. Yeah, okay, okay. I was trying to, to move my pointer to go to the next slide. Yeah, voila. Okay, I did manage. Okay, very good. Um, so yeah, um, a quick recap about Orca. Of course, uh, Ingrid already introduced it very well in the beginning. And we show already uh, three nice examples also from industry. But yeah, Orca is when we wrote the project or started it several years ago, our mission was really to accelerate software defined radios. Huh? Because a first fact is that software defined radio technology, uh, as Ingrid explains, it trades of latency with flexibility. So it is very difficult to achieve the same latency with a very flexible implementation as the parameterized code is bulkier and not that optimized. So we want to show that uh, with Orca technology, you don't always need to trade off latency and flexibility, but you can have really low latency, flexible solutions. And the second fact about a software defined radio technology uh, is that it has been around for decades now, but it's not that often used in real deployments. Eh? Cost is an issue, an FPGA is very often more expensive than an ASIC or an ASIC. Uh, but uh, what is mainly lacking is validation, test and benchmarking strategies. Eh? Software defined radio functionality is by definition new, young and fresh, but such functions are not always as rigorously tested and used. 
for and to enable this, we need a large open source community and many people that do experiments. And that's what we try to achieve also with Orca. So yeah, the Orca approach to so these two um, bottlenecks and software defined radio. Um, the first approach was to invest heavily um, in hardware acceleration. So um, our demos use all software defined radios that have FPGAs, various types of FPGAs, and a lot of the functional blocks are hence hardware accelerated and are implemented on the FPGAs. As a result, latency is as good or often even better than traditional ASIC approaches. And the second uh, thing we, we solve it by focusing uh, on relevant showcases that are driven um, by relevant scenarios. And for this, we have selected the industry 4.0 or the smart factory scenario. So already early on, uh, several years ago, when we wrote ORCA or started the research on ORCA, we thought that um, Industry 4.0 would be the, the most relevant driving show, most relevant context for driving or showcases. Why? Because it's the most challenging in terms of communication and requirements. So within the manufacturing market, application requirements vary from very low latency up to real-time 3D, 3D video-driven interaction between collaborative robots and humans to non-time critical downloads of large data volumes for updating the software of machines. And different um, applications and services often have to share this uh, wireless infrastructure in the same spectrum, making it very challenging to meet the diverging quality of service requirements simultaneously. So we need also control mechanisms that manage that um, adequately in these challenging environments. So to motivate or to explain to you how we see our industry 4.0 uh, driving environment, I'm going to steal this slide from the 5G Asia project. So 5G Asia stands for Alliance for Connected Industry and Automation. And you see here very nicely uh, what, what you need in a factory. So first, you need the supply management that requires global connectivity. Uh, then within the factory, um, you have your AGVs that drive around, and of course, they need to be controlled very reliably. Otherwise, collisions will happen. So more and more assembly lines rely on wireless connectivity to connect sensors, but also actuators and robot arms um, that take care of the assembly actively. And then there's an inventory management system that's also quite essential for an efficient factory. And then, of course, the produced goods should be delivered again globally. As you see, there are a lot of requirements. Um, some of them are related to end-to-end -end global connectivity. Connectivity. Some of them are quite uh, related to low power sensors, many of them. Some of them uh, require cameras and high throughput video links. Robot control and low latency is also an issue. And then, of course, ultra reliable guidance of our uh, AGVs. So this slide was also shown already by Ingrid this morning, but um, I wanted to repeat it because um, a lot of these things, end-to-end -end networking, the, the need to re re reconfigure and reprogram because you have all these different requirements, extreme and diverging requirements, uh, the bridging of software-defined radio with software-defined networking to have this end-to-end -end system, and also the millimeter wave bands are really essential uh, in this ORCA project. So to make a long introduction short, how did we translate this to work for driving showcases? We have selected for you the four ORCA innovation highlights on software defined radio. And the first one that we will show shows you a pioneering uh, prototype. Awesome. Because it's a very first 26 gigahertz software defined radio prototype that will be used. So it's a very lightweight millimeter wave system that we can put on a moving robot. And we will show also that the SDR control is uh, fast enough so it can track the mobile user. Uh, the second use case we will show that we can actually combine flexibility and low latency. So we will have an a use case that shows a lot of different things on a given software defined radio platform and low latency is, um, is achieved there. So this is really also a unique ORCA achievement. 
The third use case will focus on this end-to-end -end global connectivity where a unique uh, aspect of ORCA is the fact that we have this hierarchical end-to-end -end network slicing. And uh, last but not least, um, we will have the multi-rat uh, the multi -rat technology. So multi-rat stands for multi-radio access technology. The idea that we use multiple technologies together to create an ultra-reliable link. We call it smart software-defined uh, radios. So it's our smart rat. Uh, I did not know that rats were actually smart animals. Um, so to map it all to the factory, um, we have made this nice image here. So we see the four showcases, the 26 uh, gigahertz millimeter wave, high throughput millimeter wave link, video on a moving robot. Then the second one, low latency, a robot control, but a very flexible implementation. The third one, end-to-end -end network slicing to have this global connectivity for our supply chain. And uh, the last one is our smart, reliable rat, right? Okay, so this was my uh, introduction. The takeaway messages from my uh, presentation are Orca accelerates software-defined radio technology. We make um, software-defined radio implementations low latency, but we also accelerate the design and testing of these uh, prototypes. We have selected industry 4.0 as a driving showcase. And uh, finally, um, we will show you now four uh, unique software defined radio innovations that are all mapped, as I explained, on the Orca factory. So I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will now give the floor to our showcase leaders. So, Jao, uh, you can take over my screen or connect my screen. If. Uh, in the meantime, I will. I will. Or according to the agenda, it's showcase one, or sh should I go then? Oh, no, sorry. So, Robert, so yes, Robert. Yes. Um, the problem is that with this, um, yeah, when it takes over your screen, you cannot look into your notes. Okay, but I have my screen back. So, no, sorry, Roberto. Okay, Roberto uh, is a research staff and a PhD student at Theo Dresden, actually. So he's the leader of the first showcase, and not Jao. Um, and this first showcase demo, for those of you who listened well to my intro, I will show a 26 gigahertz video, uh, 26 gigahertz radio um, that's put on a, on a robot and can uh, be used for video inspection in a smart factory. Okay. Yes, so thank you, Sophie, for this introduction. And also, I want to thank uh, Chris also for hosting us very nicely. And okay, so uh, the idea of my presentation here is to give you some context before we show the demo in the video. Uh, so this is uh, the application that we envision uh, in this demo. So here we use a real-time video stream that is on the top of an AGV in the factory, and we can also remotely control this AGV for a, a remote visual inspection application in the factory. So here it's very nice because uh, today I will present the result of the ARCA project of QD uh, in the last year and to show that uh, we can really test our ideas in a uh, practical setting. Okay, so as uh, it was already mentioned, we, in this showcase we have a millimeter wave system that opens a new spectrum. That means we can increase the network capacity and we also show frequency reuse because uh, the millimeter wave beams are very narrow, so we can use more than one link in the same time and frequency uh, resources. Also, another aspect of our demo is a low latency at sub-6 gigahertz, and this will allow the remote control of the AGV, which is also interesting for industry applications. So in the end, these two things, the millimeter wave and the sub-6 giga uh, low latency link, this will allow our application, which is the video inspection in the factory with the remote control. 
So the contributions uh, of this uh, demonstrator is to show the 26 giga uh, millimeter wave transmission in real time beam steering. So as, as Sophie mentioned, we have implemented this in a software defined radio platform uh, where we have implemented the beam steering on FPGA and also the low latency sub 6 gigahertz link. This uses a uh, uh, TDMA-based multi-user system at low frequency. Okay, so before I show the video, I want to quickly uh, give a quick overview about you are about uh, to see. Uh, again, from the application viewpoint, what we want to show is a user in the factory that is doing some video inspection. That means here we have a mobile user, which is an AGV that has a camera on top filming the factory. And the, this user can actually remotely control this uh, mobile user. Uh, I will just go through here quickly now from these nodes that we show in our demo. So first we have this mobile, mobile user device that has a millimeter wave transmitter. And this uh, mobile user here, which is an AGV, it will transmit the uh, video stream in the upper link of the millimeter wave uh, link and to the base station. And the base station also controls the transmit beam of the millimeter wave equipment uh, that is in the user device. The base station also forwards the video stream to the fixed user because in the end, the fixed user wants to uh, perform the visual inspection. And the nice thing about these two links is that they use the same time and frequency resource. And here we reuse these resources because they are in different space. That means this transmission does not interfere with this transmission. Uh, and lastly, I want to comment is that this uh, fixed user also controls the, the AGV using sub-6 gigahertz link. And here, uh, both the beam control, which is a control channel, and the robot control, they actually use the same link where we share the resources here in a TDMA uh, mode. So I hope now you are uh, prepared. Uh, yes, I hope you, you are prepared now for the demo. Uh, and I, I'm happy to answer to, to answer questions if there are. Roberto, we are not hearing the sound, so maybe you should uh, do a voiceover or explain what is happening. Okay, actually, this th there is no important sound. It's just a background background music, so. I will just leave it. Okay. I think it's better because this, the video is self-explanatory. Okay.
Okay, so before I finish, I just want to to finalize with these slides to, to sum up. Uh, so in this showcase, we had a practical 26 gigahertz system that is uh, that can be employed with mobile users because we have implemented uh, this system on the FPGA. Uh, and also we have shown time and frequency resource can be used, uh, can be reused due to narrow beams. And this uh, platform is available in the test bed for future research and experimentation. So with this, I finalize uh, my presentation. And if there are questions, I can answer. Thank you. OK, thank you, Roberto. Are there questions related to this first demo? I have a general. Um... I have a general remark for everybody. In case you experience problems in receiving the videos uh, through the video call, um, each time we start a video, we also put a link to a YouTube version uh, of this video in the meeting chat. So that can be a solution for you. So then you can watch the video through YouTube uh, in real time. And with sound. And with okay. sound. Okay, and um, Roberto, in the meantime, there's a quick question for you. What was the distance and the power transmitted? Uh, the distance is about two meters, but with, uh, in this demo, uh, but we went up to four meters. And the power, this is a tricky part because this I would have to look in the antenna, but the, the power that is the input of the antenna, this is about zero dBm. Uh, but the actual irradiated power this I would have to check. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, and then we will go uh, swiftly to our second showcase, which is uh, the one of Ali. So as Ali is a final year PhD student at K Leuven. He's focusing on N-band for duplex and joint radar communication systems. He also leads the second demo, which is a joint effort actually together with iMac. Um, his demo will show that with a single software defined radio platform, a whole library of functionalities can be supported. And so we have this flexibility um, going from dense to reliable communication solutions. Also, the, he will show that the software defined radio can easily be upgraded to a radar system detecting mobility and other uh, issues in a factory. Uh, Ali, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, uh, it works. Okay, okay, so you, you, everything is okay. So, hello everybody. Thank you, Sufi, for introducing me. Yes, I'm going to present the storyline of Orca Showcase 2. Um, let me hide this. Can, can I hide this one? Uh, anyway, this is how Showcase 2 fits in Orca factory, which is an exemplar of the smart factories of future. We're going to show how multiple clients can be controlled robustly in, lo in low band frequency. In this case, for example, we have ARM robots of the assembly line. Such application requires centralized sensor monitoring and robot control. This control procedure can be done by the factory manager manually or over DA by, by a cloud-based process, processor automatically. But what we need in between is a kind of mediator to expand the network and provide concurrent, uh, concurrent control for multiple clients. The second thing is about the cloud. As I said, it's going to provide the brainless robots with processing power, but imagine it also can sense the reaction of robots and use this sensing information to enhance the control procedure. So the contribution of Orca in this um, uh, showcase can be summarized in two items. First, we are going to uh, present a real-time concurrent multi-channel gateway, which is designed based on hardware virtualization and can make happy low latency applications. And the second is a kind of 
TX RX architecture, which can deliver simultaneous communication and radar functionality without the need for extra power or an additional spectrum. So here is how the uh, demo setup looks like. We have the gateway at the middle, communicating with four other guys. The two first are ARM robots, which can be controlled by a joystick, which is directly connected to the gateway. And as you see, we have two dedicated channels, so these ARM robots can react to the commands concurrently. The third actuator is a, a drone emulator, which can be controlled by the radar communication system. And you see that the command travels to the gateway and then to the drone. But meanwhile, this device can also use this communication signal to sense the reaction of the drone. So uh, we're going to see it in the video, but let me describe it a bit. It is the spectrogram showing the packages uh, on the air. So it is, <clears throat> it is a slotted CSMA. These four first packages that you see here are beacons produced by the gateway. And you see they are all simultaneous and over four different channels. These two are from the joystick to the ARM robots. And this long package is from the radar, radar communication system to the gateway. And the last one is the packet that the gateway sends to drone. And this packet, this long one, is also the one that the radar communication system used to sense the environment. So let's switch to the video. So I may pause it a couple of times to describe. Can you see the, the video now? Yes, I can see, see the video. video. Okay, okay. It, then. okay, okay. Here we show that, uh, so this is a 3D printer printed uh, drone emulator. As I said, it is controlled by the radar communication system and the package and control travels over the air. But here we, we're going to show that when we increase the speed of the motors, you can see a meaningful Doppler signature here on the radar side. When we increase the speed, the Doppler components go away from the center, which is the zero Doppler frequency. And when we reduce the speed of the motors, these components come back to the center and gradually disappear. And here we have uh, this joystick, as I said, to control the ARM robots. This is connected to the gateway that is behind scene, and you don't see, but still the commands come over the air to these two STRs. 
And these two ARM robots are supposed to respond to the commands simultaneously. Meanwhile, you can see the, the, um, uh, uh, their signature on the radar. So the radar also can detect their movement and it's visible, however, it's a bit far. I have one more slide to go. Yes. So let me wrap up my presentation with two takeaway messages. First, the factories of future require a kind of platforms which not only can communicate with each other, but also can sense the environment and use that sensing information to enhance their functionality, their performance, or whatever task they're supposed to do. And second, we need gateways to concurrent uh, to provide concurrent control for multiple clients. And it is uh, possible by hardware virtualization in such a way that we, uh, we uh, save the hardware resources and also um, meanwhile we have high latency performance. And thank you. I also would like to thank my colleague and friend Aslam, which is not here. But anyway, I'm here to answer questions if there is any. Okay, thank you, Ali. Um, are there questions? If not, then we can slowly move on with the next showcase and the third one. And that's the one of Jao. I hope you're ready, Jao. So, Jao is a PhD researcher at Connect and Trinity College Dublin. Uh, which is University of Dublin. He's also the leader of this third demo, which has done a collaboration with IMEC or IMEC. Um, his demo will focus on end-to-end -end slicing, uh, coordinating multiple network segments for supporting diverse services, for instance, high throughput video streaming and low latency uh, robot control. So the idea here is that given any technology, how can you make uh, separated slides as well? We, we had many discussions on this already today. So, um, Jao, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, yes, yes I can see your screen. Perfect. Uh, so first of all, hello everyone, good afternoon. I would like to thank Sophie for the introduction and to Chris for the opportunity to present our work to such a specialized audience. Um, with this uh, presentation, I hope to show you the motivation and key contributions of, of our showcase, as well as its uh, operation in a practical setting. The machinery in the Orca factory relies on end-to-end -end network slicing for coexisting on top of a common shared network infrastructure, using it for applications such as um, high throughput video streaming for parts inspection, low latency remote robot control, or even um, low priority transfer of log files. The hierarchical orchestration of radio access, transport, and core networks enables a fine-grained end-to-end resource allocation for supporting such heterogeneous services at the same time. There are many network licensing solutions for the transport and core networks, such as Flowvisor, Cord, and Open Source Mano, but there are almost no alternatives when you're talking about wireless network segments. In, in addition, most end-to-end -end network orchestrators um, are one-size-fits-all solutions um, led by single communities that tend to oversimplify the particularities of different segments, leading to suboptimal end-to-end -end performance. To address these issues, uh, in Orca, we have developed two, the following two key contributions. First, 
the the OpenWiFi SR controller, uh, Linux Linux compatible open source Wi-Fi chip design, with uh, slicing capabilities at down at the physical layer, which allow us to specify to specify the exact amount of airtime we allocate for serving different users and applications. In addition, we also introduced a hierarchical orchestration architecture for end-to-end -end networks, which allows, which allows us to, to uh, manage independently each network segment by specialized orchestrators. In addition, while allowing us to coordinate the resource allocation across segments and deploying end-to-end -end network slices as a service, all through a new entity, the hyperstrator. Now, we show a recording showing the deployment of three types of, of network slices on top of an experimental end-to-end -end network infrastructure. Using the Open Wi-Fi SDR controller for slicing the radio access network and the hyperstrator to coordinate the resource allocation across segments. Oh, can you see the video? Sorry, apologies. It's out of uh, the server. Just a second.
That's it, everyone. Um, I'd be delighted to reply any questions you might have. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, if, if, um, so in the showcase too, at least showed how different functionalities could run. No, it's not a question, Yao. I'm going to make a summary and go to the next. If there, if somebody wants to ask a question, you can interrupt me. Yeah? There is a question in the meeting chat, uh, Sophie. Oh, there's a question. Oh. Okay, I need to. Okay, there's a question. Um, how does the network operator specify the control pro policy for each use case? Is there a specification of control, and how does the hyperstrator and per domain orchestrators interpret the policy? Okay. Um... The, the network operator will be able to space, specify the policies in each of the orchestrators and the hyperstrator. For example, the, the amount of uh, radio resources you want to allocate at the run or different types of routes, uh, diff different types of uh, elements, for example, load balancing, uh, firewall, and all the uh, elements in the transport network, and also the same for the core. In addition, uh, the, the operator should be able to specify the interplay of the different orchestrators at the hyperstrator. So we're still giving the network operator of that administrative domain the entire control. We're just making the configuration and the management of the entire network more modular, allowing um, specific communities um, to manage the particular uh, segments. OK. Are there other? Um... Other questions or a follow-up question? Okay, thank you. So it was clear. Um, Chris, you wanted to ask a question as well? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Okay, then um, then I'll glue a bit. So Jao has now shown how if you have all these resources and software defined software defined radios and compute resources in your network, and you have all these uh, flexible functionalities, as Ali showed in showcase two. Uh, Jao has shown how you can decide uh, how much resources to give to which functionality and how to create different slices with different reliability. Our next showcase uh, will, will, will work the way around. Huh? So that showcase will show how you could make a very reliable link by using multiple technologies or multiple radio access technologies uh, as they are called together. Huh? So it's a bit the opposite of network slicing. And that showcase will be shown or explained to us by Clemens Felder, who is a senior development engineer at NI. He's then also the leader for this port demo, and it's a collaboration between NI and TU Dresden. Thank you, Clemens. Okay. Yeah, we see your slides now. Very good. Great. And you can hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Sophie, uh, for the introduction. And also thanks, Chris, and the uh, uh, wireless community uh, for having the chance to um, present our results at the end of the ORCA project with uh, focus on our multi rad platform. And what I want to talk about, uh, about today is um, our use case uh, within the ORCA factory. So we have seen this uh, figure many times and uh, only one part is missing, right? And this one is uh, the multi-rad uh, setup uh, with focus um, on industrial uh, robot application. So to, to make uh, or to give you some uh, overview uh, about the, the whole demo so and the, the mapping to the factory what we have here is uh, this assembly line and uh, the parts um, are brought uh, to or from the assembly line to an uh, AGV so automatically guided vehicle and those AGVs are wirelessly controlled uh, with multiple radio, ex uh, radio access technologies so namely multi rats and the presence of those multi rats uh, makes it possible to take the advantage um, of available facilities on site so within this factory and it increases uh, the reliability for example if one link breaks 
furthermore, we have a dynamic control capability, uh, which allows the coordination uh, of those multiple RATs. So here, multiple RATs, uh, we have uh, an LTE link, we have a Wi-Fi link, and we also have a 5G link. So the key contributions to ORCA um, are here, yes, uh, as I mentioned, the radio access technologies, technologies, the freeze, uh, which I uh, just mentioned, the multi-rat controller, so which allows dynamic traffic routing uh, based on link conditions, for example, and a reliable con robot control application uh, using those wireless links, which allows seamless steering um, of the robot uh, during rat switching, for example. To the demo setup, so as an high-level introduction, you, you can have the vision uh, um, yeah, of, of, of this figure, for example. So what you can see here, maybe I just switch to the laser pointer now. Uh, you see here uh, some representation of an AGV, which has the three different radio access technologies. And this AGV has a camera, um, which delivers uh, in, the, uh, yeah, in the app link the road video data to the multi-rad base station. And this multi-rad base station is connected uh, to the radio access net, uh, network and uh, to its multi-rad controller. And on top of this, you can have different applications. So one is uh, steering the uh, robot um, manually using uh, such a game controller. You can also think of extension uh, using some automatic uh, steering based on some uh, algorithms or artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, exactly, and in the, up, uh, in the down link then, um, from the application there, there are robot control commands derived going through the whole link and steer the robot. Behind the scenes, you can see, or you can have the vision um, that we have three different radio access technologies. So, which you can see here on, on this uh, screen, so on the right-hand side. So we have Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi uh, physical layer connected via an, uh, with an API to higher layers, which are modeled in NS3. Then we have um, LTE link, same thing here. We have a physical layer uh, running on an FPGA and the protocol stack uh, in NS3 uh, on top. And then uh, on the left hand uh, of this part here, we, we have a 5G link. So here we integrated um, a 5G uh, GFDM uh, physical layer um, from uh, Technical University of Dresden towards our upper layer stacks uh, from NS3 with this API. Yes, and this builds uh, up the whole system uh, which we can use here um, uh, as a baseline for this uh, yeah, factory scenario, uh, which is the yeah, robot control, which lives here on top. You also have the multi-rod controller, uh, which have uh, yeah, inputs um, to the different rods. So you can grab, for example, some measurements, uh, latency values, uh, um, identifying uh, different KPIs. Uh, and on the bottom, you can see here the, the robot moving. So this as an overview, now um, I will start uh, with the, the demo video and yeah, let's start.
Okay, back again. So with this, I want to conclude uh, the last demo uh, with this takeaway messages uh, message. So the usage of multiple RUTs, which you have seen uh, a minute ago, takes advantage of available communication facilities within a smart factory, and it increases the reliability for control and operation. If you have any questions, please uh, ask now or put a question into the meeting chat. Thanks.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Michał Sibis, and I have the pleasure to show you a presentation entitled The Distance Estimation for the Database Assisted Autonomous Platonic. In my presentation, I will follow the outlines. Uh, first, I will describe uh, motivation. Then I will discuss uh, distance measurements, and I will show you um, how was the main scenario constructed, also uh, how the static scenario that we also use in our uh, research. Uh, then I will discuss proposed solution uh, that uses uh, both uh, GPS and STREC uh, 1000 results combined. Uh, I will also present you exemplary results, and I will finish with, uh, with uh, some uh, conclusions. Um, in a um, VDSA, a um, precise estimation of the distance uh, plays a significant role. Uh, rare, um, errors or um, inaccuracies in distance estimation may affect the system functionality um, twofold. Uh, first, um, may affect the um, location at distance related entries in a database, or uh, second, may affect the models that are applied in a database, for example, a model of uh, pathos applied which uh, quite strongly depends on the accuracy of the um, distance measurements. Uh, here in this picture, uh, we can see how um, relatively small errors, that is uh, plus or minus one meter and plus or minus four meter, uh, meters, uh, may affect the pathos modeling. Uh, as we can see, the, the error is very significant, especially for the, uh, for the small distances here, while for um, larger distances, the the impact of this error is not so uh, big. Okay, so um, let's skip to our um, main measurement campaign. Uh, its purpose was to model the pathos for the uh, B2B channel uh, in so-called TTY spaces, uh, what requires a very precise distance estimation. Uh, our road presented in this picture uh, consists of two parts. The first part let's say it's presented here, uh, and this is mainly an urban area, while the uh, second part, let's say starting from here up to the uh, city of Kurnik, uh, is mainly an express road. Okay, here we've got um, the measurement kit that we used while performing our main scenario. Uh, in these measurements, we used two vehicles. The first vehicle was a transmitter, while the second one was a, a receiver. Um, what kind of equipment we've got in a, in the first vehicle? Uh, first, we've got laptop and the uh, GNU radio. Yeah, GNU radio. Uh, you, we used on also USRP uh, N210 with the WBX extension card. Uh, we also used the also GPS uh, module with an external antenna. Uh, we used a PCTEL uh, antenna with a 3DBI uh, gain to transmit the data. Uh, we also used a GPS module that was built within the vehicle with uh, external antenna. Uh, the transmit power of the, for the signal used to, to estimate the channel was uh, 4.3 dBm, and th this equals um, 7.3 dBm uh, AERP uh, value. Uh, what kind of signal, signal was transmitted? So we transmitted a single ODM signal with the 50 size equals to 4096, and the sample rate was uh, uh, equal 8.3 uh, megasamples per second. Um, out of 4,000 uh, subcarriers, only 3,000 subcarriers carry some, carried some data. And the bandwidth was equal uh, roughly 6.1 um, megahertz. Okay, here we've got um, uh, information what uh, uh, in what uh, devices our second car was uh, was equipped. So in a second car we used laptop with the MATLAB environment. Uh, we also had um, uh, Prodash Farts uh, equipment with uh, with the internet Ethernet connection. And uh, to, let's say, store the data, we use uh, so-called IQ uh, samples mode. We also use a GPS uh, receiver with a USB connection to, to have information about the actual position of the, of the vehicle. And we also use the AOR uh, zero dBi uh, antenna to receive the, 
uh, the signal. Uh, okay, so what we've done with the received signal, so uh, after each four of the symbols, that is, some, that is equal to 16,384 samples, we uh, asynchronously uh, say save the data and to each data packet we add a gps tag to have the exact information what is the current position of the of the car and of the collected uh, samples um, uh, in order to assess the correctness of distance measurements uh, between uh, first and second uh, vehicle in this in this scenario uh, we performed also additional static experiment uh, as the both uh, equipments for, for GPS measurements and the uh, UVB uh, measurements may introduce some errors, we uh, need to use a reference. Um, in static experiment, we put the vehicles in three fixed positions uh, with the distance measured with the use of uh, measuring tape. Uh, these three distances between the vehicles were uh, 4.5 meter, 20.25 meter, and 44 um, uh, meters. And uh, here in this table, we've got some, uh, some basic statistics. And um, as we can see, in general, the mean offset for the GPS and for the uh, UVB, uh, UWB is somehow well say constant. So it does not depend on the, uh, on the distance between the, the car. A similar observation can be made for the standard deviation. So we can say that, that the standard deviation, both for GPS and for UWB, is not affected by the distance. But what is more important here, we can see that uh, uh, results obtained with the UWB are far more precise with the, compared to the um, results obtained with the uh, GPS due to the standard deviation. Yeah? So mean standard deviation uh, for U UWB is uh, 0.03. Yeah, while uh, for the GPS four point, let's say four. Um, um, here we can see a plot presenting the, um, the difference between the exact measured distance and the mean distance. So we can say that this difference reflects the uh, standard deviation of the uh, GPS signal and of the UWB uh, signal. And as we can see the a GPS curve uh, suffers significantly from some oscillation, while the UWB uh, signal have almost no uh, fluctuation. Uh, also, what is also very important, um, the GPS uh, signal is uh, very strongly uh, correlated in time. Yeah? So this also affects the, the GPS measurements. Um, here we've got um, a histogram, yeah, actually two histograms for the GPS and for the UWB. And these both uh, the histograms present the operation range of the, of the approaches uh, used during the main um, experiment. Uh, it need to be mentioned actually that the shape of the GPS histogram, uh, so presented on the left hand side, is affected not only by its performance, but also by, uh, is affected by um, the experiment itself, yeah. Uh, the shape of the UWB histogram uh, actually clearly shows that the useful range of this, um, of this technique is significantly shorter. 90% uh, of the measurements done with, uh, with the use of uh, UWB is below 83 meters. Yeah? So this is actually um, the, higher, the, the, the greatest drawback of the, uh, of the UWB, so the distance is uh, not so far. Yeah, so the maximum distance that can be measured is far closer than the maximum distance that can be measured with the use of um, GPS. Um, the last aspect that also affects the measurements is the number of, uh, uh, of gaps yeah, and its sizes in a, uh, in a main experiment. Uh, this histogram presents the distribution of the uh, gaps for the GPS and for the uh, UWB. Uh, figure, uh, this uh, figure actually really shows that in the case of GPS uh, measurements, the gaps in the results are very rare, and most of the gaps have a small size. Yeah, so as we can see, number of gaps with a small size, for example, in the GPS here is equal to only five. Yeah. The, the opposite situation is actually observed for the UWB measurements. Uh, in this case, number of gaps is uh, 
quite high, I would say. Yeah, and we also can uh, observe some some wider gaps. Yeah, for example, here. Yeah? So number of these gaps is not so uh, not so big. It's if let's say few, but for uh, for the very small sizes, yeah, number of gaps is I would say significant. Okay, so what is our proposed solution to combine the results with the GPS and, uh, and UVB to improve their uh, performance? Okay, so here we've got five steps. The first step is the calculation of the standard deviation of the uh, UVB-based and GPS-based um, measurements. And uh, these uh, um, standard deviations will be further used in, a, uh, in the main loop of the uh, algorithm. Uh, in step number two, a resampling procedure is performed. Uh, this resampling is used as a method for a um, signal reconstruction. And uh, due to significant error that can be introduced by this uh, uh, method in the case if the number of data is uh, insufficient, uh, we decided to limit uh, to 20 samples in the case of the UWD measurements. And in the case of the GPS measurements, we limit the, the gap to only uh, six samples. Uh, actually, the most suitable um, uh, approach to find the, the size of the gaps that can be reconstructed with the use of this method is actually to, to use the uh, MSE yeah, and to against the, the MSE uh, with the cap size. Yeah? So we need to, the, to find the value uh, of, the, uh, of the size of the, of the gap. Uh, just before the uh, increase of the MSA became for us unacceptable. Yeah? Okay, um, in the case of step number uh, three, uh, we upsample the GPS data. The purpose of this step is to obtain uh, GPS measurements exactly at the same time distance as for the uh, UWD. Uh, in uh, step number four, we actually combine the data of the GPS and the, uh, and the UVB. The procedure actually assumes that if uh, for both uh, measurements equipment actually, so for the GPS and uh, UWB measurements um, are obtained at the given time instant, we simply use the maximum ratio combining with, with the weights uh, calculated based on the, on the standard deviation of the GPS and UWB uh, signal. Uh, in the case, if only GPS or only UWB measurements are uh, available, uh, we simply take these measurements to the output. But uh, in the case, if at this level we have no data for, uh, for GPS and no data for UWB, uh, we simply assume that our algorithm uh, generates uh, no distance for this uh, time, um, for this time instant. Um, this uh, step actually, uh, in general, are able to generate uh, good quality data. Uh, however, uh, in the case of transition between GPS plus UWB to GPS only, or from uh, GPS only to GPS plus, plus uh, UWB, uh, we may observe some sudden step in output data. Yeah? So to, to overcome this, um, we decided to add some filtering with the use of the uh, honey window. Uh, this uh, uh, filtering was performed only on the data that was calculated as a difference between the uh, GPS and the UWB measurements. And this filtered signal is considered somehow as a correcting signal and is subsequently added to the uh, output uh, given as the output uh, of the step number uh, four. Um, exemplary. Uh, curve presenting the, the GPS and the UW measurements as well as the output is, uh, is presented here. As you can see, the GPS uh, measurements are marked here with uh, the red marks. Yeah, the uh, UW measurements are um, black asterisk. Yeah? And an exemplary of the, let's say, unwanted uh, step in, a, in the data is presented here, the first one, yeah? We can see some, some serious step. It's a range of five to six meter. And quite similar step is presented here, yeah? And after we add some, some filtering, yeah, so we switch from the green curve to the, the blue curve, we actually see that no, uh, no step in the output data is uh, further observed. 
Okay, so um, to conclude, um, we proposed a new approach to distance estimation in a vehicular application and uh, data fusion and analysis from two sources, means from uh, GPS receiver and the UVB based wire system, uh, will be, let's say, beneficial for, for, um, for estimation of the, of the distance in the case of uh, um, wireless vehicular system. Um, thank you for your attention.
Hello everyone, my name is Hidayat from the University of Greenwich and I'm presenting a paper titled A Price Deferred Acceptance Technique for D2D Communication for the Factories of the Future. So I'm going to give a rundown of the outline. First, I'm going to introduce us to the paper and the motivation for the work. I'm going to talk about the aim and the objectives for the paper, um, then um, discuss the methodology, that's the approach that was adopted in solving the problem. Then I'll discuss the results and yeah, then con finally conclude and suggest directions for future work. So um, ultra-reliable low latency communication is one of the um, use cases for internet, uh, 5G internet of things. And um, wireless factory automation is one of the most demanding use cases with uh, ultra reliable low latency communication requirements, that is, high reliability and low latency quality of service um, demand. Um, device to device communication is um, a promising technology. Um, that has been proposed to facilitate massive machine-to-machine -machine communication in the factories of the future because of um, the setup 
um, devices in co in proximity can communicate um, without um, transversing the main um, network in infrastructure. So, in terms of spectrum access, um, device to device, the device to device communication users can um, can access um, dedicated um, um, channels and um, can also um, share resources with um, the cellular users for the purpose of um, um, better spectrum utilization. Um, however, resource sharing can bring about interference, which may result in performance degradation. So um, interference um, coordination and management is necessary so that the quality of service um, requirement for all the users are met. So the aim and the objective. The aim um, of the paper is to maximize the overall system throughput while satisfying the quality of service requirement for the cellular users and the day-to-day -day users. So the constraints are what is given in equation one, um, the signal to interference to the signal um, to interference plus noise ratio for the cellular users and the day-to-day -day users must be met. Also, the day-to-day -day user have um, a reliability constraint that has to be satisfied. And there is um, a threshold on the transmit power that is allowed for the cellular users and the day-to-day -day users. And the channel use, um, um, the channel access um, between the cellular users and the D2D users is what is given in equation 1F and 1G that is on the one-to-one -one basis that, um, I mean, um, the D2D user can only access the um, channel of one cellular user, cellular user, why a cellular user can allow just one D2D user to access its channel. So the objectives are are to determine the achieved throughput and the reuse gain. So the approach to solving this problem, um, um, you have two approaches. First of all, we're going to look at um, joint admission and power control. This is going to be talking about how interference is managed in the system. And the matching, that is the pairing between the cellular devices, the cellular users and the D2D users. The D2D users in this context are the factory devices, the sensors, the actuators that um, already have established um, um, communication, I mean, between the D2D -day transmitter and the D2D -day re receiver, the communication has already did, they, I mean, the um, communication has already been established between them in advance for um, the matching resource allocation. So we are going to look at uh, two approaches to solving the matching problem. We are going to look at the distribu a, a distributed approach. This is going to be the major focus of um, our work uh, because 5G and beyond network, um, network are envisioned to support autonomy and self-organization. So a distribu distributed solution is the most viable approach to solving such um, radio resource management problem. So we are going to be comparing the results from there with centralized approaches. Um, we're going to be looking at first feasible assignment algorithm and also random algorithm. So um, we're going to look at interference management. So in equation two, what we have there, um, first of all, we try to, we relaxed the channel constraint so that to, to reduce the complexity of the work. So with that, we are able to obtain um, um, equation two. So equation two is um, um, the condition for which the SINR will be guaranteed. So um, equation two implies that the distance between the, um, the distance of the interfering link should be greater than the distance of the intended signal link with these um, 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 devices with um, large interference. I mean, for a D2D user and a cellular user that want to share or reu um, to share, that want to share a channel, the distance of the interfering link must be greater than the distance of the intended link for both of them, both SINR 
to be guaranteed. So we obtained um, a, um, a the power pair hex streamer for the um, um, the cellular user and the D to D user. So that is what is given in equation three. Equation three a is the minimum transmit power for the cellular user, and three b is the minimum. Sorry, um, 3A is the minimum transmit power for the cellular user. 3B is the maximum transmit power. 3C is the minimum um, transmit power for the D2D -D user, while 3D is the maximum transmit power. Um, but because we have a, 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 a transmit power that has been set in the constraint, we have a maximum transmit power. This set of power extrema has to be constrained so that it doesn't exceed um, that which has already been set in the constraint for the optimization problem. So um, um, PC and PD, which is in equation, four, in equation 4A and 4B respectively, denote the set of power pair for power pair extrema for um, the cellular user and the D2D -D user. So the set of possible power pair for the cellular user and the D2D -D user to share a subchannel is the Cartesian product of PC and PD. So having obtained that, as earlier stated, we have a maximum um, transmit power that has been set in the constraint for the optimization problem. So we eliminate those power pair that uh, them that um, exceed the maximum. So having having done that. Having done that, then we obtain the set of power pair for which the reliability constraint is, um, is met. Um, then next, we obtain um, um, the set of um, the power pair for which the optimal, um, the optimal power pair for which the throughput is guaranteed. Um, so um, the next thing is we come to the matching the matching that is the pairing between the cellular users and the D2D users. So um, we are going to look at the um, the proposed the, pre the proposed um, deferred acceptance algorithm. So um, the deferred acceptance algorithm is uh, is um, has been used over time to solve stable marriage problem um, on a one to one basis. That is. Um, we have um, a, a, a man being paired to a woman in the algorithm. Um, um, however, that um, the deferred acceptance algorithm has been used to for um, um, in a setup where we have equal size of um, the opposite side, men and women. Now, if you like, uh, we have you have equal um, size of the opposing set. So um, in a case where, you, where the sizes of the sets vary or the preference list vary, um, the deferred, um, deferred acceptance algorithm might not give us um, the um, optimal um, outcome or output in terms of spectrum sharing. So um, um, that's the reason why we proposed a price deferred acceptance algorithm to address this issue. In, in price in, in, in the deferred acceptance algorithm, um, um, we have um, the players of each set generating their preference list. Then we have a proposing side that make proposal to the side that accepts or rejects the proposal. So a side, um, a player proposes to um, in, in a particular set proposes to um, another player in. Uh, in the opposing set, and the player that accepts or rejects accepts the most um, preferred, um, the most preferred um, um, member of the opposing set. So, and the algorithm continues right like that till um, all the players are assigned, and then the algorithm terminates. But in our case, um, what we um, did is that um, since the the, the sizes of um, the sets are different since we have um, a case where we have um, um, opposing sets with different sizes. Let's say the size of the cellular users um, are five and the D2D users are 
say three or ten. So we, we, we proposed in such a way, we proposed um, the price deferred um, algorithm such that um, in, in our context here, the, the cellular users are, um, are um, the proposers. They had the one proposing to the D2D -D users. So the D2D -D user either accept or reject the proposal. So when um, the cellular users when they propose to the D2D -D user, instead of the D2D -D user or to a D, instead of, um, if a, a cellular user proposes to a D2D -D user, instead of the D2D -D user to accept the um, the most preferred or the um, the the highest rank um, cellular user, it will um, it will accept the proposal of the most preferred. Um, cellular user with the least preference list. With that, we can have um, a higher number of 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 of, um, of pairing between the cellular user and the D2D -D user at the output, because um, preference is given to um, the cellular users with shorter preference list. So with that, we can have more pairings at the output. So um, this um, is the results. I mean, these are the results of um, from our simulation, and we try to compare the results with that of the random and the first feasible assignment approach. Um, um, as I stated, the um, the prime um, price deferred acceptance approach is is a distributed approach where local information local information um, is used by the users, while the random and the first feasible assignment uh, method are a, a centralized approach. So we can see from, from figure one, um, especially as um, the number of D to D user in the network exceeds 30, we can see um, the um, preferred deferred acceptance showing um, superiority in the number of uh, admitted D to D pairs, and that is because um, 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 preference is given. There is priority for cellular users. Cellular users making the proposal to the D to D user. Preference is given. Priority is given to those cellular user with lower preference list. So a D to D user will consider the most preferred um, cellular user with the least preference list. So um, we have more pairings at the output. So that um, 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 translates. So when we have um, a higher number of D to D, um, the number of admitted D to D translates directly to the DUE throughput. So we can see it here. Also, we can see that from um, it became it's much obvious as. Um, um, the number of D2D -D users exceeds um, 35. You can see that the D2D -D throughput is um, um, throughput for the price deferred acceptance algorithm is obviously um, greater than that of the random and the first feasible assignment um, algorithm. So um, finally, we compare it also in terms of um, the system throughput. And we can also see as um, the number of D2D -D user exceeds um, 35. We can see that the, um, the um, uh, preferred deferred acceptance algorithm also um, improved the system throughput. And, um, and that's just um, because um, we have number, I have number of pairings. I have number of pairings, so we have um, as we have more D to D um, D to D user admitted into the network. So, in conclusion, we have um, compared. We have looked at um, um, two different um, radio resource management techniques: centralized and distributed for um, D to D enabled cellular network, um, focusing on wireless. Um, um, industrial applications and um, our aim is to maximize the overall system throughputs for the um, D2D users. D2D users in this context are the in-factory devices, the sensors, the actuators and the cellular users in a case where they want to reuse, they want to share channels. So the first step 
was to um, to um, um, in the first step was to look at the interference management by joint um, power and admission control. We obtained the set of um, cellular users and D2D users with um, minimum um, guaranteed quality of service requirement, and then we um, got um, we obtained the optimal power allocation that maximizes the throughput. Then finally, um, the uh, matching was done to obtain the um, optimal resource sharing partners. So from the simulation, we can see that um, um, the, um, price, the, the presented price, the father set as algorithm um, from the um, graph, um, especially um, um, in figure one and two, we can see improved performance um, as the number of D2D users increase in the system and um, for the system throughputs we can see that um, um, the um, the performance of our presented algorithm that's the pda the price defined acceptance algorithm is um, slightly better and comparable with that of the centralized approach that's the ffa and the random approach the random approach expectedly performed worse because um, no optimization was done once um, this um, the constraints that is um, has been has been has been guaranteed. The matching is just done randomly. So um, this um, the price deferred acceptance algorithm is is um, shows an improvement with an advantage of a, of, of much reduced signaling since it's distributed local only um, local information is for um, local information is. Um, acquired there is no need for a, a centralized controller to to acquire all the um the channel state information for all the user in the system so the complexity and the um, um signaling overhead is much re um, reduced so in future we would like to look at machine learning approaches to the um, machine learning approaches to solve this problem and evaluate the um, amount of signals that signaling overhead that it to generate. Thank you for listening.
Hello, everyone. I'm Yun Zhuren from Peking University of Posts and Telecommunications, Beijing, China. I am very honored to participate the Corona 2020. Today, I will present our paper, Data Driven Intelligent Management of Energy Constrained Autonomous Vehicles in Smarter Cities. I will introduce our paper from following four accepts. Firstly, the background and motivation. I, intelligent transportation is an important component of future smart cities, and electric autonomous vehicles, or EAVs for short, are envisioned to be the main form of transportation because EAVs can save energy, protect the environment, and improve service efficiency. The exciting work mostly rich research of EVs and AVs has not started the large-scale unified scheduling of EAVs by considering both the constraint of energy storage capacity and the limited number of charging pairs in each charging station. Therefore, our intelligent management system provides a look ahead into the solution for a joint development of available EAVs in a more practical way. The right pictures are some EVs companies. These are the contributions of our paper. The first one, an intelligent management scheme to jointly share do the travel and charging activities of the EAV fleet is proposed to minimize the total cruise energy con consumption and match passengers' requests and limited charging pairs. The second one, we, we further propose a concentrated vehicle dispatching or CVD for short or algorithm. And the last, simulations on the collected real Beijing electric taxi data site and the diamond uh, trade is effectiveness. effectiveness. Next, I would like to introduce the structure of electric taxis data set and the system model. Our experiment is based on a real data set. We have obtained a real-world electric ta taxi data set which contains the driving trajectory and electric taxi behaviors in Beijing. The picture on the left shows the details of the data set. We choose an area with a relatively concentrated traffic volume in Beijing as our observation area and divide the observation area into 361 grid regions, as shown in the picture on the right. The road topology details are suppressed in each region, and the region is considered as a black box. Vehicles in the region are considered as a quick that is affected by traffic fleet coming in and out of the region. 
in the figure. The fleas are represented by the red and green arrows. The entire city's transportation network can be translated into a queuing network made up of black boxes. Without considering the behavior of the EAVs inside each grid region. To simulate the computerized autonomous service strategy of EAVs, the NC traffic model in our prior work is extended to model the incoming new requests and outgoing served requests for EAVs. For a time-slotted system, we donate OTN as the optimal number of incoming requests for EAVs in region N during the time slot T. Let STN denote the number of available EAVs during time slot T in region N. To design an energy-aware EAV scheduling algorithm, in addition to the travel energy model, the battery state of each EAV and the order-specific energy consumption are the other two fundamental inputs where the first one is given in the original data set, while the latter can be derived, derived by calculating the differences in battery states when, during, when driving from one location to another. The curve fitted by these two parameters is on, as shown in the figure. Okay, the next part, intelligent management system. To minimize the total energy consumption of EAVs, an energy-aware scheduling scheme is designed to control the passenger order fulfillment and the charging activities of EAVs. Firstly, we match process between vehicles and the passenger requests with considering the limited driving range and long charging time. For the concentrated minimum weight matching problem, we have designed the CVD algorithm. Now, I will introduce the CVD algorithm in the, this section. Without considering the energy gap concentrate in equation 4, the KM algorithm can find the pairing between row and column over the weight matrix E, such that the total weight of the selected pairs is minimized. In the proposed CVD algorithm, we try to find maximum weight matching for a bipartite growth with the concentrate of energy supply by adding the judgment into the KM algorithm while dis dispatching. If the battery state of a vehicle can't certify the energy demand of an order, then the vehicle can't be dispatched to the order. After the matching process between EAVs and orders, the system is left with a set of EAVs that cannot fulfill the order requirement due to its efficient energy supply. The charging schedule of EAVs is concentrated by the number and the location of charging stations given in 
equation five, as well as the capacity of a smart grid given in equation six. Similar to equation three, the matching target is to minimize the EAV's energy consumption. In the matching process, we ensure that the remaining power of the matched vehicles can support them to reach the charging pair and avoid avoiding the overload of urban power grid supply. Next, I will introduce our simulation results and analysis. analysis. First, we simulate the optimal number of demands for EAVs and the number of server requests for grid region. The pictures show the simulation results of low traffic slot and heavy traffic slot. We can notice the supply of electric taxis in Beijing is lagging behind the optimal de demand. In particular, the supply is about 88.6% of demand during peak hours. It's on the collected real-world electric vehicle data site. We match the EAVs and the customer orders for two hours with the proposed CVD algorithm. The energy spent on picking up passengers with and without dispatching are shown in the two figures. The results indicate that dispatching can reduce energy consumption by 73.5% on average. The number of orders fulfilled with our allocation scheme is about 52% more than that without dispatching. This shows the energy consumption of EAVs and the utilization rate of charging. If it can be observed that charging dispatch can reduce the energy spent on cruising to the charging piles by 10 to 20 percent. Moreover, the utilization rate of charging piles is also significantly improved with the props charging scheduling algorithm. In this part, we propose an intelligent scheduling system for EAVs while considering the energy-related constraints. The scheduling share comprehensive, comprehensively considers the energy constraint, vehicle's order fulfillment, and energy replenishment. If the in the desired framework, EAVs with sufficient energy supply will be matched to fulfill the customer orders, while EAVs with insufficient energy supply will be scheduled to charge at the charging station, which is powered by the urban smart grid. Simulation results show that the proposed EAV's dispatch scheme can save cruising energy and improve both the charging station's utilization rate and the order compilation rate. Here are some important references. That's all, thank you.
Well, hey, hello to everyone. My name is Christian Jesus Bacarrubio, and I am really happy today to present here our paper entitled as a primer on large intelligent surface in an industrial setting. First, I would like to provide a kind of an overview of my background. I'm a PhD student in Norbert University in Denmark in the connectivity section group led by Petar Popovsky. So once this being said, uh, let's get started. So first, I would like to introduce the concept of large intelligent surface. What is a large intelligent surface? Is It could be defined as a large continuous electromagnetic surface able to transmit and receive radio waves. One of the main characteristics or features of these surfaces is that they are really easily integrable into the environment. So this means that they are really easily deployed in walls and the surroundings and so on. Uh, although the majority of the work uh, in literature has been focused on the communication aspects of uh, large intelligent surfaces, uh, it is interesting to analyze and exploit their sensing capabilities in order to perform some wireless optimizations at the end as a goal, like uh, beamforming. Here I have included a, a figure of a typical, let's say, use case of a large intelligent surface in which we can see that there is a communication between an access point and a user. Uh, the, access, the access point is trying to communicate with the user, but we can see that the direct path is blocked by an obstacle, this wrong cube in the middle. So instead, uh, the signal is sent uh, towards the surface and mm, the surface is smart enough to reconfigure its antenna elements in order to be informed the signal towards the users and in this way, solving the communication problem. So, it is important to highlight the concept of holographic sensing. Uh, we can use the, the large intelligent surface to take advantage of the communication signals that are occurring in our environment to represent this information as an image. Here in the figure, I have tried to highlight the, an example. So we see the, these two women that they are using their phones and the signals are traveling through the air, but they are impinging into obstacles that are occurring in the space. And then the reflection of these signals is generating some, let's say, perturbances in the wall measurement-based images according to the measurements in the large intelligent surfaces that I will be explaining later on. So the first question to wonder is, uh, what is then the concept of holographic image? The concept of holographic image uh, is related to the fact that because of having a huge number of antenna elements in the surface, this allows us to have a really accurate environment sensing, uh, which is translated at the end to a really high resolution image in terms, in terms of pixels. So uh, because of the fact of translating the information of the propagation environment into an image, we are reducing the complexity uh, to treat uh, this information as an image, as I'm highlighting. And then this allows us to use some machine learning tools and algorithms and so on, especially the computer vision ones that are specifically for image processing and so on. So then we can use also image processing to take advantage of the propagation environment and analyze it properly. Here I have included two exemplary uh, holographic images. The first one is in a line of sight scenario, so no scatterers are placed in the environment or anything. So we can see that there is a really clean image in terms of shapes and so on. But the most important uh, image to take into account is the second one. So here we have an industrial scenario. And we can see that the holographic image that we are obtaining in the, in the, in the surface is really accurate and is even capturing kind of the shape of the scatterers that are occurring in the environment. So we can see that we can exploit this information to exploit some machine learning techniques and computer vision to try to take advantage of this pattern uh, that is representing what's going on in a, a specific radiant propagation environment. So once all this being said, let's talk about the problem formulation of our paper. And then uh, our goal is to determine if a robot is, uh, is following its predefined route or not uh, in an industrial scenario. So here in the figure, I have included a, a robot that is highlighted in red. And then let's imagine that it's following a predefined route uh, dominated by this red arrow. Finally, at the end, we are deploying a large intelligent surface at, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the room. And then 
our problem uh, would be translated into determining if the transmission of the robot, because the robot uh, has a transmitter on top that is transmitting a sensing signal. So the problem is to determine if the robot has deviated or not, we just have to rely on uh, how um, trying to know if a signal has been transmitted from an anomalous position or from an incorrect position. Uh, for the sake of simplicity in a real system deployment, and because we just want to sense large scale events, uh, we resort on the signal amplitude, uh, given only just the power. So uh, we don't need to estimate the phase or anything, so incoherent detectors are enough for this uh, task. If we, want to, if we wanted to formulate this problem, uh, we could see that the receive signal vector would look as follows. So we have the receive signal vector with respect to the sensing signal X and from different position, correct or anomalous, plus the, the complex Gaussian noise. Then our receive power vector would be just the, the squared modulus of the receive signal vector, of course. And a way uh, to address this problem could be performing an hypothesis test that is expressed in the, in the, third, in the third term, the third equation. Here, we would need to estimate the joint probability distribution of the received signal power condition to be to has been transmitted for a correct point, similar to the anomalous point, and then also we would need to know the a priori probabilities of a point being transmitted from the anomalous point of the correct or a correct point in the route. As we can see here, uh, this could, this would be really cumbersome and site dependent because. Uh, we would need to, if we were to to detect if the robot is in an anomalous position or not, we would need to estimate these joint probabilities, which means that we will need to know all the channel realizations from all the different paths. Also, uh, we will need to assume that we know the a priori probabilities of a point being transmitted from a correct position or not, which is something impractical in a system deployment and is not trivial. And also, we wouldn't be able to determine if two points uh, belong uh, are to the same route, or these two points, one is from the anomalous route and one is from the correct route. So once all this being said, we, th we think that uh, we can try to apply machine learning techniques to perform the anomaly detection based on the holographic images. So somehow look, what we are doing is trying to take advantage of machine learning to understand how the received power signal behavior uh, translates into the position of the robot to determine if it has been deviated or not. So here it is described the machine learning model that we have used for our problem. Uh, the input to our algorithm is an 8 bits grayscale image, uh, which is the result of mapping the received power values to the range of uh, 8 bits uh, scale image, so 0 to 255. And then again, uh, because of the fact that we are not needing to estimate phase, the, the incoherent detectors are enough for this problem. Uh, also, because we want to avoid the sec excessive scanning periods and, and so on, we are using uh, transfer learning. Uh, one of the main features of transfer learning is the fact that uh, it works well when the data set is small. And that's uh, small in the sense of data points. That's why, uh, because of the fact we want to scan the, uh, the environment uh, really few times, uh, we would have a small data set and we use transfer learning to take advantage of that. Uh, then, for, uh, for this matter, we reuse the parameters of the VGG19, the weights and, the, and its biases, for performing feature extraction. So we can see that in the, in the figure that I had in, in the bottom of the slide, the white, uh, the white squares corresponds to the previous reuse architecture from VGG19 that we have used to perform the feature extraction. And then the blue blocks corresponds to our addition to the architecture. Uh, with the extracted features from the images, we have used a support vector machine for the classification task. And the reason why we have chosen the support vector machine is basically because it's been proven to work well in a high dimensional feature space. And as we can see uh, from the output from the, from the feature extractor, our uh, feature space is really large. So it suits uh, the fact of using a support vector machine for this matter. Uh, also, I wanted to, to highlight uh, how we have modeled this problem and how we have validated it. And so in order to simulate in a reliable way all the paths of the transmissions uh, in occurring in the environment, we have used a ray tracing software. 
And for that, we have simulated the uh, uh, NP points of both correct and anomalous routes. Then we assume that we can obtain NS extra samples per point. And our data set is, is composed by 10 times 367 uh, uh, points. So as we can see, we have just scanned uh, a really short uh, period, I mean, a really short time, because we just have uh, a really small data set uh, that is possible to be addressed with this uh, small amount of data because of the transfer learning uh, strategy. Uh, also in the table one, the, there is some parameter, I mean, there is a summary of the main parameters used in, the, in our model. So our frequency is 3.5 gigahertz, the transmission power of the robot is 20 dBm. We have simulated 20 ray paths in order to have a really accurate uh, high resolution image from the, from the surface. The antenna type is omnidirectional. We have tested uh, several uh, antenna spacing among the among the elements of the surface in order to see how it impacts in the performance. We will be describing, I mean, speaking about this later on. And finally, the propagation model used is free space. Uh, here in the figure, I have um, tried to represent the specific deviation cases that we have treated. We have the blue line that corresponds to the correct route, and then we have Mm, we have analyzed two deviations, a deviation of 10 centimeters and a deviation of 50 centimeters. In this way, we can uh, see how accurate our system is in, uh, depending on how uh, small the deviation between the correct route and an anomalous route is. Um, here in this slide, I am just showing how we have modeled the received power and, uh, and the noise. So we have modeled the complex electric field in every I antenna element as the superposition of all the ray paths in pinging into every antenna element. So here we are just adding up uh, one to the number of rays of com the complex electric, electric field. Uh, also, uh, the complex signal then is the result of this expression because we have assumed isotropic antennas and then also uh, for the sake of simplicity, the impedance I, we have assumed it to be one uh, for every case. And then uh, set zero would be the free space impedance. Also, because we wanted to analyze the performance of our system under different SNR uh, conditions, we have defined this average signal to noise ratio, which is the, defined as the average among all the all elements of the surface, one to M, and all the data points in the data set, the one to T. It is important uh, to highlight that uh, the in image classification algorithm, the contribution, I mean, is these kind of algorithms are really sensitive to noise. So uh, we assume that we can obtain S extra samples at each coherent interval in every point of the routes. So these S extra samples, we would be using them uh, to average the, uh, the measurements that we obtain in such a way that when S is, uh, we can see that with S is large enough, tends to infinity, then uh, the value of the channel, uh, I mean, the value of the received power condition to the channel in that specific uh, situation is no longer a random variable because we are reducing the noise variant. And in this way, we are preserving the pattern of the image with the addition of a constant factor sigma squared corresponding to the power of the noise. So in this way, uh, by averaging, what we are uh, obtaining is reducing the noise contribution and getting a more meaningful pattern. Finally, in these slides, uh, I have included the kind of an analysis of different parameters of the surface that uh, impact on the sensing performance, and, it, and they are important to highlight. First, uh, uh, the first figure, which is the one in the left side, uh, is the impact of the noise averaging strategy that we have just uh, pointed out in the previous slide. So reducing the noise variance contribution to, in order to preserve the pattern for classification. Here we can see that the blue line, which corresponds to, let's say, raw data, um, has no uh, averaging perform or anything. So we can see that when the noise contribution is non-negligible, around 10 and 0 dBs, the performance of the system qu uh, drop quite significantly. Also, uh, we have tested several S extra samples, 10, 50, and 100, precisely. 
And then we can see that the more extra samples that we obtain, the better we get rid of the noise variance, and then the better the pattern is, is preserved and the classification performance is uh, in, improved. So here we can see uh, that the S equal to 100 is the one that yields the best uh, results. Uh, for the rest of the, of the figures, we are fixing this averaging strategy. Then uh, we have the, the impact of the interantenna distance uh, in the surface. And for that, we have uh, analyzed this, the two deviations, the deviations of 10 centimeters and deviation of 50 centimeters. And then we can see that the curves green and brown, which corresponds to the two lambda, uh, two lambda separation uh, of, of antenna elements, uh, is yielding a really, a really bad performance because this separation, which is far from the concept of least, is not enough. And then we can see that when the, the closer the antenna elements are, the more accurate. Uh, the sensi performance is. This uh, make, I mean, allow us to get a conclusion that the quick variations in every of the power values received in the, all the antenna elements are important uh, for the classification performance. So uh, we can conclude that the lambda over two, which is the blue line and the red line, of course, are the best uh, for this uh, system. And finally, uh, an analysis of the aperture is performed. Also, uh, we have tested the different deviations, 50 centimeters and 10 centimeters. And then we have changed the aperture in terms of uh, numbers of number of antenna elements compounding in the surface. Um, of course, when the more number of antennas we have, the better is the performance. But this is because of a, of the, a property of the large intelligent surface, which is called the pattern is, well, the, it's spatial consistency. Uh, the spatial consistency is the ability of the surface to capture these shapes of the scatterers and so on. So the more antennas we have, the higher resolution we have. And at the end, the better, the best way to capture the environment and to get a pattern that is useful to classify for the, for our system. So finally, uh, to conclude, uh, the three conclusions that we obtain here are the following. Uh, first, uh, using a number of extra samples, the higher the better, because we are averaging and reducing the noise contribution, which allows to preserve the pattern uh, in, a best, in the best way. Secondly, uh, the, the interantenna distance uh, among the antenna elements is important, because the quick variations along the surface are useful for the sensing performance. And finally, the higher the aperture, the better uh, capture of the pattern uh, because of the uh, spatial consistency of the large intelligent surface. Thank you so much for your attention.
Good morning, good afternoon. Today I discuss challenges of enabling and stimulating multiple stakeholders to have a more active participation in the future 5G ecosystem and give an outline of key implication of novel spectrum management approaches for business model transformations. This paper provides a comprehensive overview of the recent spectrum regulation decision and show how local licensing and spectrum sharing approaches work as novel business model antecedents. My name is Seppo Yrila and I work as a principal engineer at Nokia Enterprise and as a professor of practice in techno-economics at the University of Oulu. This study was done uh, with my research partner Pekka Ojanen I would like to acknowledge 5G VIMA project funded by Business Finland. Present business model continue to be structured around connectivity service mass provisioning with high advanced investments in infrastructure and exclusive long-term spectrum licenses. On the other hand, enabled by ongoing architecture evolution that leverages softwareization, virtualization, edge cloudification and service-based architecture, delivery of resources and service is being transformed from centralized incumbent mobile network operator centric system towards ecosystemic platform mode of operation. Ever increasing variety of spectrum bands and higher frequencies with novel local industrial use cases have further fragmented spectrum administration and management. Nationwide long-term spectrum assignments are completed by local 5G licenses, dynamic and shared spectrum access and unlicensed access. We are moving from one to many in spectrum as well as networks, data, intelligent stakeholders, users and business. Digitalization has been disrupting traditional industries in an unprecedented speed and the telecommunication and wireless is no exception. Nokia, for example, has been adapting to the needs of an ever-changing world for over 150 years from its humble beginning in 1865 with a single paper mill by the Nokia River during Industry 1.0 era, as you can see on the photo. How to get cables and wireless connect enterprises and various verticals timely and affordably fulfilling their critical operational requirements. The world's most valuable resource is no longer oil. Future scenarios envision society that will be data-driven, enabled by near instant and unlimited wireless connectivity to the intelligent. This calls for a multidisciplinary approach and reimagining re how we create, deliver, consume data, services, resources and spectrum. While engineering research stemming from product and manufacturing platforms is focusing on components and interfaces aiming at creating economies of scale, the economics, on the other hand, discusses how to connect demand and supply in order to grow, create innovation ecosystem and enter new market. Recent discussion has focused on how to transformation from current centralized closed network for connectivity business models towards network of services model built on platform with data and algorithms and even further how novel spectrum administration and management can enable the decentralization, innovation and novel value configurations. With roots in both engineering and economics, this study discusses how could 5G business model transform from close to supply focused towards open ecosystem focused, exploiting novel spectrum administration and management. The cases in this paper present spectrum management approaches in several countries and key licensed frequency bands considered for LTE and now 5G. The license exempt usage of the 5, 6 and 60 gigahertz bands is also addressed. Spectrum management 
aiming at efficient utilization of the scarce resource can be divided into three approaches. Market-based mechanisms, administrative assignments, and spectrum commons. The market-based mechanism allows the market to define who values the spectrum the most and should be granted the rights to use the spectrum. The most widely used spectrum auction mechanism has continued to limit the number of spectrum access rights while the number of operators of different kind wishing to enter the market kept increasing. On the other hand, market-based approach has introduced flexibility through recent spectrum trading and leasing and subleasing options. The traditional administrative assignment approach where the national regulatory authority have defined individual spectrum access rights decided on the related rules and conditions such as mandatory coverage obligation and assigned spectrum to cellular networks. The first generations of mobile connectivity market were in the hands of the regulators. In the course of time, regulators opened the market for competition and lately novel administrative methods like regional and different local licensing have emerged. Unlicensed Spectrum Commons allows market entry to a variety of systems and stakeholders based on shared access to the spectrum. Traditionally, the unlicensed approach, the source of success for wireless local area network, has not attracted mobile network operators. On the other hand, in the 4G and 5G era, to cope with exponentially growing data traffic, 4G and lately 5G technology variants for unlicensed access in certain bands have been introduced, like LTEU, Multifier, and lately 5G New Radio unlicensed. In the US, the band 3.55 to 3.7 gigahertz has been made dynamically available for citizen broadband radio service. The CPRS is comprised of three tiers, incumbent as tier one users, individually authorized priority access license tier 2 PAL users, and general authorized access tier, tier 3 GAA users. Authorization allows the licensees to access the spectrum resource not used by the incumbent, while the incumbent must be protected from harmful, harmful interference. The rules allows the PAL licensees to lease the spectrum, which is outside of their actual deployment. Spectrum not used by incumbents or by a PAL licensee is available for general authorized access users on the opportunistic license by the rule basis. For both the PAL and GAA, the base stations must register with the spectrum access system SAS and request the spectrum grant. Just in August 2020, the Pell auction bidding concluded and raised a total of 4.5 billion US dollars with 228 bidders and over 20,000 licenses. This auction was a unique in a way that many qualified bidders included non-traditional auction participants, utilities, rural service providers, uni universities and others joint wireless and cable service providers in bidding. The most common authorization procedure for issuing local licenses is administrative assignment, applying first come first served approach. Usually, there's a yearly fee for the spectrum usage depending on the coverage, bandwidth, and number of radios. Some frameworks offer interference protection between local networks based on the coordination by the regulator or by technical means, while in other cases the approach is uncoordinated, leaving coexistence management to the licensees. A couple of examples, uh, use cases in, in this study. The UK regulator Ofcom has made Spectrum in four shared bands locally available through shared access licenses on 1.8, 2.3, 4 and 26 gigahertz bands. 
Furthermore, local access license provides a way for users to access Spectrum license to operators in locations where mobile network operators is not using its full spectrum. In Finland and many European countries, band 42.3 GHz band is used for other services than mobile broadband, and refarming would be impractical. The 20 MHz bandwidth has been allocated to mobile service on secondary basis and designated to private mobile networks. Furthermore, in Finland, the 26 GHz, 850 MHz bandwidth was not auctioned and will be reserved for local private 5G deployments early 2021. In France, the 2.6 GHz band has been planned for public mobile networks, but was not licensed because of the lack of market demand. Instead, 40 MHz bandwidth was made available for professional mobile networks and private networks. 50 MHz bandwidth in the 3.6 GHz band in Canada is dedicated for local wireless broadband service. The band is shared between all licensees within the service area and the licensees are expected to cooperate in order to identify and resolve possible interference problems. The regulator ISET provides spectrum management system database to assist coexistence. In the Netherlands, to protect the incumbent satellite usage on 3.4 and 3.7 GHz in the northern part of the country, those bands are available only for local broadband networks, and on the other hand, in the rest of the country with certain operational limitations. This opportunity has been very popular. More than 150 licenses have been issued, and in some areas the band is getting fully occupied. In Germany, the lower 3.7 GHz band were auctioned uh, 2019 for public mobile networks, while upper 1 GHz bandwidth was left for local private assignments. Eligibility is related to land ownership or right of use. 74 licenses and 50 experimental assignments have been awarded by September 2020. Furthermore, the 26 GHz band will, be, will complement the 3.7 band early next year, 2021, with wider bandwidth for different industrial applications. The Belgian operator in, intends to allow private networks in the 4 GHz band on 2021. Licenses will be local and not transferable. The BIPT make a compatibility study for the application determines the technical condition and assigns the frequencies. At the same time in Hong Kong, the 28 GHz band has been made available on geographically shared basis for local deployment. The assignment for four 100 MHz channels are being made on first come first served basis. Licenses shall coordinate and agree with other licenses on technical coexistence measures. In Japan, local 5G initiatives aims at making spectrum available for vertical sector. The band 28.2 to 28.3 GHz has been already awarded. The aim is to make the band 28.3 to 29.1 GHz available later after the sharing condition studies with satellite incumbents are completed. Australian regulator plans to make the 26 GHz band as well available for fixed point-to-point -point and mobile network deployments till end of this year 2020. Several authorization schemes are foreseen for different parts of the band. Uh, class license, kind of exempt, apparatus license, and spectrum license. The wide range of authorization options is planned to support innovative 5G uh, applications and use cases. Spectrum Commons bands allow operation of compliant radios under general authorization without an individual authorization. 
technical or regulatory means are employed to facilitate coexistence with other applications in the band. Radio communication sector of the ITU has identified 5 GHz band globally for wireless access system, including radio local area networks, RLANs. Number of technical requirements have been defined to avoid interference. Uh, FCC in the US has defined their specific technical requirements for deployment and operational applicability as well in, in many, many several other countries outside of US. In addition to LTE-based LTEU and multifier technologies, the 3GPP has lately standardized 5G new radio unlicensed for the band in release 16, just came out. On 6 GHz, recently FCC as well made additional spectrum available for unlicensed services. Two subbands are allowed for standard power access points operating under control of an automated frequency coordination system. At the same time in Europe, the SEPT is studying the feasibility of making the band availability and in UK, Ofcom will make part of the band available, enabling indoor use and very low power outdoor usage. Like 5 GHz as well as 6 GHz, the 3GPP has developed 5G new radio unlicensed standard as a part of release 16. In the value creation process, firms may have one or more roles, designing novel ways to link heterogeneous resources with needs, stressing the role of all value co-creators in the ecosystem. Novel spectrum management approaches could assist the progression of value creation from closed integrator and collaborator models towards ecosystem-focused transaction and bridging models. As an integrator, a focal orchestrating firm converts resources into a new form and creates value for customers. This can be regarded as a traditional type of closed value chain resource configuration utilized in mobile network operators' exclusive spectrum-based connectivity. Collaborator orchestrates with partners generating assets to supply and service the demand of customers. The company creates value by collaborating and engaging other complementer firms' resources with its own. Emerging spectrum trading, leasing and partnering models are emerging in offering dedicated services to verticals. A transaction enabler is associated with platform business model enabled by digitalization. Broader and easier access to resources allows orchestrating firm to build two or multi-sided market to match resources and needs. From spectrum management perspective, uh, in the first phase, regulator can act as a focal orchestrating firm for local licensing. In the US CPRS spectrum sharing model, spectrum management and transactional platform is outsourced to SaaS service operators. A bridge provider bridge certain groups of market participants that are not connected. CPRS priority access licenses PALS will open new opportunities for a bridge provider via SaaS marketplace matching spectrum supply and demand. 5G exploiting novel spectrum management can be built on novel business opportunities, value generation, competitive advantage that have positive consequences on scalability, replicability and sustainability. Novel opportunities were found in utilization of local spectrum, unlicensed spectrum offering and shared spectrum marketplace in offering connectivity services to growing industrial automation segment. Value creation, delivery, sharing and capture are considered the key elements of functioning business model. Transformation from nationwide multi-million spectrum licensing towards distinct local valuation and pricing, automated low transaction cost administration and sharing economy-based spectrum sharing are creating new value. 
As the mobile broadband business has started to even out, industrial automation across verticals is seen as a new value capture opportunity with higher willingness to pay based on quality and service level agreements. Timely access to affordable, exclusive spectrum based on use case and business need will lower entry barrier and create advantage, particular to new stakeholders. To summarize, enablers for 5G growth via scalability and replicability were found in radio standardization, automation and transaction platforms. Furthermore, compared to traditional spectrum administration and management, novel local licensing and sharing were found essential contributors to spectrum resource efficiency and sustainability. There are few framing elements need to be considered. In the mobile operator business network deployment, details are considered business operational critical information that many database-based spectrum administration and management concept requests. In addition to ever-increasing variety of spectrum bands, fragmented regulation due to national policies and differentiating incumbent usage can seriously reduce scalability and replicability. Furthermore, coexistence and interference management between neighboring operators calls for new technologies. This figure summarizes the key findings of how existing archetypes of closed and supply-focused mobile broadband business models can be transformed towards a novel open ecosystem-focused scenario, leveraging spectrum management approaches. In addition to Spectrum Commons, both the administrative local licensing and CPRS sharing concepts were found to democratize the tools of production through access to affordable Spectrum, cutting the cost of consumption, distribution with web scale automation, and connecting supply and demand utilizing automated SaaS marketplace. Roots in economics and engineering, the study presents the insights for a novel type of future spectrum management approaches, exploring opportunities of creating, capturing and sharing value. Enabling and stimulating multiple cross-industry stakeholders to have a more active participation in 5G calls for open ecosystem-focused value configuration business models. The transformation builds on transaction platform a marketplace for spectrum, as well as all the virtualized network resources, data and analytics. Local licensing and spectrum sharing methods and technologies may give rise to new ways of organizing and configuring spectrum resources and markets. Thank you for your time, questions and discussions.
Hello everybody. My name is Maria Matinnikko Blue and I come from the University of Oulu. I'm presenting this invited paper titled Moving from 5G in Verticals to Sustainable 6G Business Regulatory and Technical Research Prospects. And this is a joint work with my colleagues Seppo Yrjölä and Petri Ahokangas. And the outline of my presentation is the following. First, I'll give you some introductory remarks and then go into the review of the status of 5G in verticals and then something about the path towards sustainable 6G. And there I'm focusing on business scenarios that we have developed for 6G as a joint effort with a group of people. And then at the end, there are some conclusions. So as the introduction, the mobile communication research of 5G is especially focusing on the use of 5G to help the different verticals. And within this context, for several years, we've been looking into the emergence of local 5G network deployments. Local 5G networks, closed private networks in specific areas, geographically restricted areas. And it was already three years ago when we published a journal paper on these local microoperators to boost service delivery in 5G. And since then, a lot of stuff has happened around these local operator models. Three years ago, the objection was really strong, but now there seems to be the 5G in verticals through the local network seems to be becoming more and more important. And at the same time, the research on 6G has also started. Finland started 6G flagship program, the world's first research 6G research program, already two and a half years ago. And that activity already a year ago established a link between the 6G and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are both targeting the year 2030. And we did another white paper more on this relation very recently. So these developments, the 5G in verticals and also the path towards sustainable 6G, they call for a very, very multidisciplinary approach. And we've identified that the business regulation and technology domains are very important. They are highly interrelated and we need to take into account these three domains in the research addressing the 5G in verticals and development of sustainable 6G. And the current paper, an invited paper, it's a, providing a summary of recent advances related to 5G in verticals from these three perspectives, business regulation technology viewpoints, and also presents the preliminary steps towards sustainable 6G. And the findings of this paper, this work was conducted within a Finnish national level Business Finland funded pro research project, 5G Vima, 5G, where 5G is being applied to the, dif to the industry vertical. And also within the 6G flagships, 6G white paper preparation that took place earlier this year and resulted in several new 6G white papers. And this research then presents alternative business scenarios for 6G targeting the year 2030, considering these interrelations of regulation, technology and business. So then going to the first topic, the 5G in verticals. Start and starting from the business perspective. So we do, we've done studies regarding these different perspectives and the things that I'm just trying to introduce the concepts and the ideas that might be beneficial when, when you're doing your own research around, around the future systems. So from the business perspective for 5G, especially for 5G in verticals, we would like to highlight these four, four topics the convergence of connectivity and data platforms. There are the connectivity networks, there's a lot of data taking place and they are stored in different platforms and made available through different platforms. So there's this convergence of the connectivity domain and then the IT domain. And there are ecosystems within these domains like the 4G, 4G ecosystem or then some data platform ecosystems and they are now merging 
or colliding. There are several different ecosystems and now we are at this point of, of those ecosystems meeting and also new ecosystems emerging. And then the second part is the, related to the business model. So business models, they are a well, an often used terminology. They describe the organization's way of, of operations, how they, what, how they create value and capture value. And they, within this business model domain, we would like to emphasize two, two concepts, scalability and replicability. And you can see what they mean as a scalable business model. It, it gives you exponentially increasing, increasing returns of scale when you add new resources. So the growth becomes exponential when you add a unit of new resources. And then the replicability is the, uh, is the approach that a replicable business model can be easily copied to several markets simultaneous and you only need to do minimum variations. So these two, scalability and replicability, are very important concepts when thinking about what the business, what the business models for the future could look like. And then sustainability is very big theme. It has a lot of definition. It's now coming. You can't avoid it. So there are many aspects, economic sustainability, societal, environmental sustainability, and that's what the future telecom systems have to take into account. And one big theme here is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So to conclude, the 5G networks, when they are not only providing mobile broadband to, to end users, they are to like end customers, private people or companies, they are also addressing to serve the different verticals, often through local networks. And this gives rise to new platform-based business models for the different stakeholders and their stakeholder roles are also, also changing. So the, the picture of this business ecosystem, it's, it's evolving constantly and it's just a lot of uncertainty what the future will look like. So development of a business model for sustainability is the goal of, of many companies today and that is describing how the organization, what is its value proposition and how it creates and delivers this value and how it actually captures the, the value that it is proposing. So the building the vertical 5C business opportunities, those new business models, they need to be scalable, replicable and sustainable and also legitimate. The legitimacy is, a, is an important idea that when the world is changing, roles are changing, still only certain players are legitimate, are allowed to do certain things. And they come from the regulations and they also not only come from the regulations, but also from the common practices, what is allowed, what is acceptable. So then moving on to this regulation perspective, like I've mentioned several times, this emergence of local 5G networks is happening to complement the mobile network operators offerings. And this is totally depending on the regulatory environment. Some countries are allowing the establishment of these networks and they are they're very much dependent on the spectrum access, the rights to use the spectrum. You need, a, need the spectrum to deploy these networks unless you operate in the unlicensed bands. So the regulatory environment for the use of 5G in verticals is it's very complicated. It has this rules from this electronic communication market, the telecom market, the ICT market, and then it meets with the verticals own specific regulations like within a port area or within a factory. So these two domains meet and they have not the rules within these verticals have not been designed with the goal of ICT technology in mind, what ICT technology could do there. So we are already experiencing this colliding, colliding things within the regulations of the different domains. And then as an example, we, we wrote a paper on the regulatory elements of, of the telecom side for 5G, 5G and there are many, many regulations. It's highly regulated. The telecom market is highly regulated in terms of access, pricing, competition, privacy and authorization. And there, especially the rights to use the radio spectrum is very important because that defines who is allowed to deploy the networks. And when we made a paper about the first 5G spectrum awards, 
mainly in the 3.5 gigahertz band, we already observed a lot of differences in the approaches that the national regulators had taken. There are local licenses somewhere. There are countrywide licenses through auctions elsewhere. There are different kinds of approaches. So the, there is divergence, unlike in 4G, but now in 5G, there is high divergence between the countries. And then from the technology perspective, the 5G architecture, it should bring flexibility and the key, there are many key technologies that are coming there that are helping to use 5G in verticals. Virtualization, localization, among other things. And then this use, the ability to create network slices to serve different customer sets. That's very, very interesting way to allow the networks to serve the different customer sets through different, to serve their very different needs. And then one key technical challenge is the operations in the higher carrier frequencies. The, the availability of the spectrum is a challenge, but also the network size, the coverage is highly restricted when we go higher in the frequencies like 26 gigahertz band. And then something about the sustainable 6G. And here I'd like to mention that the 6G flagship where I coordinate the research currently, we published 11 new white papers in June. And two of them are very much related to, to, to this topic, the white paper on 6G drivers and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I led that expert group and we identified some mega trends and then we developed a linking between 6G and the SDG, noting that the 6G can have a threefold role. It support, provides services, but it's also a measuring tool for reporting of, of various indicators and the telecom sector should fully be supporting the achievement of the SDG. And then another white paper relevant here is the white paper on business of 6G led, led by the co-author Seppo Uriola and that went deeper into the trends and developed scenarios and then four of those scenarios developed within this process are summarized also in this, in this invited paper. So something about the business regulars and technology perspectives for 6G networks, the digital convergence across industries, it's, it's increasing. 5G is coming to verticals. Well, what will happen in 10 years from now? It's, it'll be a very different world when we have telecom sector going across all the industries and the whole society. And then there are many unanswered questions about these ecosystemic business models that have to be sustainable. And they are they're the regulatory environment shapes this, these developments very much by defining what is allowed and what is not. And then this business evolution of the business ecosystems, new stakeholders are emerging, new players are, are emerging and operations are changing. And then how to find these different places for the different players within the future ecosystem. And also the technology vision work is, is starting at the ITU level. There we are already seeing, seeing the technology vision development, which will then a few years from now, we're going to the development of new indicators. And we already has to have to be preparing for that, what would be the new indicators for 6G, taking the sustainability into account. And energy efficiency definitely is one important thing there and how that should be defined and measured. It's a very big, big technical topic to, to discuss. So then we did these, these business scenarios and we, we used a workshop pro procedure. We had an expert group that Zeppo was leading and we had international experts joining through remote meetings. We identified a lot of different forces driving the future towards 2030. And from these forces, we developed two dimensions value creation dimension and value configuration dimension and defined end points for these dimensions. And then we developed scenarios. This gives us a matrix of four, four, four blocks when we consider these ends. And then we developed these four alternative business scenarios for 6G in detail and then assessed them. And this is also documented in the white paper. And this is a summary of the develop, those, those four scenarios that were developed. And you can find the details of these scenarios within our, our invited paper and also the white paper. 
And then for some of these scenarios, we started to look into what they mean. We, we described these scenarios and what they mean as the strategies. So what, how these scenarios would look like, what needs to be done. And there we used a simple rules strategic framework as a tool. And that gives the, the steps or processes that need to be considered in order to, to seize the opportunities. And here we develop these for two different scenarios. We assess these developed scenarios and realize that the most plausible of the scenarios is the operator dominated, the big MNO dominated scenario. And then the most preferred is a new, totally new local sustainable edge scenario. But since time is running, you can read the scenarios in detail in the paper in the invited paper and then the white and the white paper. And just to summarize, I'd like to mention this that this most plausible scenario, MNO 6.0, is where the future telecom market is building on top of the use of the big MNO's wide existing customer base. And the still the demand for for the capacity is increasing and the networks are trying to meet to these demands by strengthening customer lock-in and using the existing dominant market position that comes from the connectivity market and that is pretty much coming from the regulatory decisions on the spectrum part who gets has these long-term spectrum licenses to operate. So then there are these big operators hold on to their spectrum and, and from this this table you can see the different opportunity how to boundary priority timing and exit rules that come from the simple rules framework and it's a, it's a nice tool to depict the strategies for the future and we also did this for the most preferred scenario which is called sustainable edge scenario and this is then the local extreme it's built building on top of new local specialized demand and we have we are addressing narrow business segments like governmental and verticals and they have very different requirements there so these are like specialized networks to serve those special needs situations very locally so thinking and acting locally close to the customer and this is based on resource sharing also based on spectrum sharing which is the topic of the crowncom conference and then the use of virtual virtualized infrastructure but more details are in the paper and I'd just like to conclude and give you the future outlook that within this paper we've highlighted the importance of the triangle of business regulation and technology perspective when doing research. So we, we are doing research in 15 verticals and also sustainable 6G from these three angles and often they are separate. Often there's technology studies or business studies or regulation studies but they are very inter, intertwined and that's the, the approach that we've taken for a long time already now and we would like to invite you to to collaborate on these topics and the major challenge is that how could 6g become a truly general purpose technology and help the verticals to support their goals because they are getting stringent requirements for sustainability from the government so they're, they're all struggling to meet these goals by the year 2030 and there the role of ICT and mobile communication networks is, is very crucial. So that concludes the presentations. And if you're interested to prepare papers, the next EU CNC is conference is organized together with 6G Summit in June. So the call for paper is papers is published. So please have a look at that. Thank you.
Dear participants, we are glad to announce the best paper award for CrownCom 2020. The award goes to the paper Novel Spectrum Administration and Management Approaches Transform 5G Towards Open Ecosystemic Business Models by Seppo Iriola and Pekka Oyanen for their valuable contribution to the analysis of the transformation of existing business models and the creation of opportunities for new stakeholders in 5G scenarios enabled by flexible spectrum administration and management. Congratulations for a well-deserved achievement. Thanks for attending the 2020 edition of CrownCom. We hope that you found the contributions by our speakers interesting and that they will inspire new ideas and solutions toward the creation of a wireless ecosystem capable of taking advantage of the opportunities offered by increasing flexibility in spectrum management and higher intelligence in both devices and networks. In closing this edition of CrownCom, we would like to thank again the speakers, the participants, all the colleagues that made this event possible, and EAI for their support in this organization. On behalf of Liliana and myself, let me say that we look forward to the next edition of CrownCom, hoping that we will be able to meet in person again.